Hello, everybody. Debo here. Today we're talking about anything, really. Comics, whatever. Preferences, whatever you want. Marvel, DC, uh, Dark Horse, Image. Uh, the fact that I have... <laughs> I have not planned ahead too well and have uh, a different audio going background. So, yeah, and today we got the gauntlet here. What we're going to be really talking about, uh, well, what I kind of wanted to talk about is the Infinity Gauntlet, the differences between the comic version and the cinematic stuff. Um, if people wanted to, I don't know, um, nothing really big planned today as far as builds go. Um, because what, what I've got on my plate for builds for next is uh, redoing my city services building, which is essentially police, um, city hall, you know, the courts and whatnot, trying to get that all into a single building. Um, and at the same time, have a Lego store at the bottom of it. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, as you can see, I have a selection of, uh, comic short boxes back here, um, mostly dealing with Marvel stuff. Uh, but there are a couple independent titles in there as well. Um, so Checkers is just stopped in. Hey, buddy. Yeah, she's she never jumps up on anything really, um, unless she uh, unless she's hunting something down. Probably her sister, but not today. But yeah, so. So we're here in uh, in the Lego room in the city, my the city, and just gonna show you real quick. Um, got the uh, city hall slash police station slash all that broken down to uh, pretty much started again. And the only thing left here, hey Tim, what's going on, yo? Good to, good to see you. Um, so yeah, this is this is the Lego store that. Uh, it was what a 24 hey brick anista what's going on brick rainista is in the house uh may the clutch be with you but yeah so uh this was a 24 like 24 25 however you want to think about it uh dollar set from uh the lego store which was a lego store and then i expanded it like i went big with it i thought i had everybody out of here well, that was a roof tile Oh, and I don't have everybody out of here, but I'm taking a look inside real quick. The light will uh, help me. You can see the pick a brick wall there in the back is kind of huge. Extra large uh, interior space there. Well, we have uh, box sets on the shelves. On this other side here, we have tiles. Um, and this is, that. I mean, these, these all represent, of course, Lego uh, sets and whatnot. But uh, I need to uh, I need to redo this, make it look a little bit I don't know more accessible. Uh, get some more light in there from the sides, even though it's going to be cramped into a uh, thanks. Thank you, Brickinista. Um, even though it's going to be cramped in between some other buildings, uh, I I almost thought of trying to do like a U-shaped store with a central staircase going up to the other part of the building, but I'm going to have to see what the bricks are going to lead me to because it's. It's a little bit up in the air right now. But yeah, so I've, I've made some modifications to it. Um, and I'm probably going to make a couple more. But this is this is one of those sets that Tiffany got me. And when Tiffany gets me a set, she usually likes to see it remain intact. Uh, so I want to try and preserve as much of the original uh, as, as is possible. But just to give you an idea of um, what goes on when I when I redo a building like that, of course, because it's, it's populated, right? Uh, it's got everybody and everything in there. Well, this is everybody that I've removed. And probably can't tilt it too much here. Let's see if I can tilt the camera a little bit. Just to give you a good idea. So, yeah, we got uh, triple or double-decker couch. It's just a whole slew of people. We got the uh, organ with a kitty on top from, uh, from the Goonies Dimension set. Various villains hanging out in there, you know, first Mr. Freeze, mayor of the town, the uh, various police officers and cave people, people that were in there um, 
to get married. Uh, the judge was supposed to be in here, but I think he's officiating at a uh, bigger wedding that's in the white building that's next door. Hey, Monica, hoy hoy. Uh, and as you can see behind me, I was working last week, last Monday, trying to get that garage together, right? Trying to get a good start, a good basis for, for whatever it was going to become. Well, it's it's pretty much finished. I just need a real good, decent cornice for the top there to kind of um, give a good line to demarcate what the two buildings actually are. Uh, so that's something I got to work on. And then the Ferrari Museum, uh, reduced and lifted, is next door. So, yeah, it's uh, hopefully I'll be able to take a look at that in a hot second. Uh, but as you can see over here, we got the comic book boxes. And I know people are very Marvel versus DC. It's very much a bipartisan issue with a lot of folks. Uh, not so much for me, because for me, it's Marvel, DC. Uh, back in the day, I mean, Image, uh, Acclaim Comics for a little bit. Uh, and then it was uh, Valiant Comics, crossovers between all these folks, Dark Horse. Uh, Dark Horse is notable because it was one of the first um, first publishers that really brought manga to uh, to the United States uh, in the form of got Akira. Um, they did the first publishing of Astro Boys or Astro Boys, the Astro Boy series. DC for the win. Yeah, a lot of a lot of folks are going to be on that page. But w one thing I do want to point out is like Marvel and DC share a lot of the same creative artists. Um, Writers will work for one company, go over to the other. Uh, same for art or uh, the pencilers and inkers and colorists. Uh, back in the day, lettering used to be a thing. Now it's all you know, fonts and whatnot. Um, but oh, let me. What was I? Where was I going with that? Okay, so there there was a specific way that Marvel did things uh, right around the time when Stan Lee was doing the writing. Uh, because the way the Marvel offices were organized and everybody was pretty much under the same roof at that time, all in New York City, right? What would happen with the stories? Um, Stan Lee was doing so many titles at once. He'd pretty much come up with just a basic outline of what he wanted the, where he wanted the story to go and progress. And so he would send that, you know, basic layout uh, to the artist, Jack Kirby, uh, most famously. Uh, and then the artist would take and flesh out the entire ser entire thing um, and leave, you know, areas for where Stan thought he was going to, you know, put some dialogue and things like that. So the, um, the essence of the idea was sent to the artist. The artist fleshed out the entire thing. And then once that was done, that finished work went back to Stan and Stan would write the dialogue. He would write the story. He would write everything out. And a lot of times the uh, the artist would make jumps and interpretations of certain things and Stan would adjust to that. Uh, he'd, he'd work it into whatever the, uh, the storyline was that uh, they were going for. So that, that was the dynamic that you had at Marvel. Now DC is much more traditional where uh, a writer would write the thing all, you know, 22 or however many pages of it. Uh, send it to the artist. The artist would do the whole thing and then send it back, you know, and then they do lettering and all that extra stuff afterwards. So there was kind of, kind of a different, different dynamic at play. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fourth world Adam is a huge, uh, Jack Kirby fan. Yeah. We've, yeah, we, we've got kind of a thing there. Um, yeah, and J Marvel and DC are both enjoyable. That's 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 the thing. You like you don't have to choose a side. It's it's not anything like that. Like it's not as as Americans we want to make everything either or, uh, good or bad, black or white, um, Democrat or Republican. You know, it's it's got to be either or. Whereas it it doesn't take in a lot of alternative <laughs> versions of things. And and a lot of folks are making these Marvel versus DC decisions off of uh, off of the movies, which you know is understandable. It's, it's accessible, uh, especially at the uh, rate that comic books are going for these days. Especially if you want to like read every monthly issue, it's going to be like three to five bucks per pop there. Uh, so why not wait for a graphic novel, right? And if the graphic novels prove to be too expensive for you, just you know rent or watch the movie stream, like everything streaming on everything now. So you can find it somewhere.
Uh, but speaking of Jack Kirby and uh, Stan, I do have uh, some very key issues going on behind me here. But uh, yeah, actually, um, Monica, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> Marvel is kind of, it seems like they're ahead right now in, in the, um, in the non-comic media, right? But, uh, you know, take, take, let's take a look back at the 70s and 80s and all that. I mean, Superman was uh, a TV series, black and black and white. Batman, you know, or, or an original TV series there. Then they had a, like a Spider-Man show, which was okay, but it didn't get the same kind of, hey, Aqua Mike, what's going on? Uh, just in time, we're talking, we're talking comics today. Um, and then you look at the actual films when, when they came out, what was the, the first big comic book movie was of course, Superman. Right. Uh, and you know, Christopher Reeve, like who's not gonna, you know, just totally fall for that character. Like, you know, it embodies everything that, you know, a person wants to be and, uh, has a certain moral code that they follow. And, you know, the, 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 the cleaner idea of a superhero, right. You know, it's, it's pretty much unblemished, uh, you know, do-gooder, you know, stuff like that. Whereas you get into Batman, okay, and then, um, you know, you had, what, four uh, Superman movies originally, and then Batman, you know, like, 89, took things a lot darker, right? It, it wasn't so, so happy-go-lucky. And, I mean, that's, that's the thing about Batman, like, Superman was first, what, 39, I think it was, for Action Comics number one, something like that. And then um, De Detective Comics 27, was it, where Batman first showed up? Um, yeah, so, I mean, that stuff was was way back in the day. And Marvel actually came along a couple of years later with their first superheroes. I think it was 41 that uh, um, the first ones debuted there. Yes, exactly, Brickinista. Christopher Reeve is the Superman and Sean Connery is the James Bond. Iconic in those roles. Uh, define those roles. Really. So everybody after Christopher Reeve is going to actually sort of emulate Christopher Reeve. Um, the same thing as, you know, the James Bonds with Sean Connery, except for I mean, you got you got you got a couple of people that stepped out of the norm on that one. But for the most part, everybody, I mean, Timothy Dalton was standing. Uh kind of followed that same playboyish uh super agent kind of a deal yes they set the stage hey buggy uh they set set the stage for the evolutions of those characters they 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 define those characters really they they laid out parameters for for everybody to you know kind of work within from therefore henceforth yeah that's the word henceforth but yeah oh checkers you want to jump up here She's not going to jump up there. She's just going to check out things and uh, bat at stray Lego that might have hit the floor this morning. Um, but yeah, so we got the we're getting some gauntlet talk in today. Uh, took a look at the modified uh, Lego place here. Uh, I did do something kind of crazy. Um, I already had like four of the video uh, bandmates, right? And I went to Target and I'm thinking I'm going to just grab a couple more boxes because last time I was there. They have maybe five more bandmates sitting out on the show. Well, between that last time and then the time I went a couple days ago, the bandmates exploded. I mean, like all the pegs were full. Um, they were they were just thrown loose on the shelf. Everything was crazy everywhere. Uh, but at the bottom of all those loose figures or all those loose boxes was one of the um, open boxes, which is actually what I have the computer sitting on right now, that, uh, that had everything intact with the two rows, uh, 12 and 12. So I, I took a shot. I was like, all right, I don't want to keep buying figures over and over and over again to try and see if I get what I want. So I took half that box. Actually, I took half that box out of the box and then took that other half up to the register because I like, I like to grab the boxes if I can. Um, so yeah, I ended up getting all the video bandmates. And so I have doubles of my four favorites, which I'm cool with. I'm about to have a triple of my absolute favorite, which I'm all right with. I'm going to take his uh, jacket for my sig fig. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, these guys are all in here. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the alien DJ. So if you, if you heard that sound, yeah, it was a little wild, but, uh, I have my figures when, when I'm doing something like this, uh, moving things around a lot, 
or if I have uh, people I still need to enter into my uh, into my uh, city census database thing, uh, I'll I'll make sure they're all like kind of sequestered until I get them, you know, all registered and whatnot. <sighs> registered registration and such. Well, that that leads us back into X Men, doesn't it? Like mutant registration and things like that. Um, one thing that Marvel and DC had to set themselves apart, of course, was the cast of characters, right? Um, Batman was villain heavy. Like Arkham Asylum, for some reason, can't keep anybody contained for too long before they bust out and get up to some kind of ruckus again, you know, just causing shenanigans all over. And then Batman's got to grab them and put them back in there. And, you know, that cycle just can't kind of repeats and continues. And the backstory for Batman is, is, is pretty interesting. So that, that makes him one of my favorite DC characters. Um, but the way, yeah, the way I look at the Marvel and DC, I look at it by character. I look at it by um, how long a certain artist or a certain writer was doing a title, um, because sometimes that, you know, kicks it way up. And then they put somebody, you know, just, just some rookie coming in to fill in some pages in there and then, you know, way down. Um, quarantine for Deboopolis. Kinda, kinda a little bit. Kinda, it's it, it's almost like, Ellis Island is over this way, and then everybody, you know, eventually makes their way into town. Um, unless they do, everybody here is equal. Um, that's that's just that's just the way we go. There's there's no real class status. I mean, there's a lot of superheroes and a lot of regular folk, but um, the superheroes kind of you know do the right thing, and everybody respects what everybody does. I mean, the superheroes need to eat, so they respect the the person who served them hot dogs or pizza over here and slinging pies. Um, that's that's the way we we work it in this town. Um, yeah, but there was something else back here I was going to show you. I can't remember. Oh, yes. Here we go. So I ended up picking this up very cheap. Uh, it's the Sunset Racer. Uh, it's a creator three in one. Uh, 20 bucks, I think, is the regular price for it. But I got it uh, for a semi-decent discount. But I just want to point out how awesome this car is. Uh, this is the original first build. Uh, for it. It does, of course, come with uh, three set, sets of instructions. Uh, second build is a old-school formula racer uh, with the open wheels, and the third build is a speedboat. But this this racer right here, it's it's got a lot of character. It's got a lot of style. It has a cockpit that will fit a minifigure, and the, uh, the steering wheel actually goes up so you can fit somebody in there. So if you can get a hold of this one, even if you just want to use it for parts, it's it's a good one to get a hold of. Uh, and it has my favorite windshield, that curved one, the old Speed Racer style. So good stuff. Um, wheels, of course, are nice and th it's got that thick, thick rubber to it. Uh, and it has the reversible ones because I know Brickinista is not a fan of this side. But if you just flip it over here, it, it does have the spokes. And it's got the six six spokes on there. So, so whichever uh, style appeals to you more, you can go with. It's like I say, it's a, it's a good cheap set. Get it if you can. It's been out for a little bit, uh, so it's probably on verge of retiring or at least becoming slightly scarce. Slightly scarce. But so we've got the comics over here, and I'm tr I'm, I'm trying to make an environment where not too much Lego is going to fall when I move things around. We're we're gonna see how that goes. But there are a few notable uh, first first appearances and stuff that we have in here. And I don't collect comics anymore. Uh, big surprise. Because my interest shifted to Lego. And you can't like buy comics on a weekly basis and buy Lego with any kind of regularity. It's it's just not gonna work for you financially. You're gonna you're gonna be broke or you've got so much money that it's it's kind of awesome for you but here we have an early issue uh power of warlock number one adam warlock uh really coming on the scene and busting out making a name for himself this box is generally uh adam warlock stuff so we have Warlock and the Infinity Watch, which is essentially the aftermath of what happened with the Infinity Gauntlet series. Uh, pretty decent read. I think it went up to 25 issues. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's 
Let's see. Here's one. Now this one. This is Captain Marvel number one. This is Marvel, you know, the character who uh, was Captain Marvel before Carol Danvers in the movies. And this is actually the first appearance of Carol Danvers because Marvel crashes uh, and she is at a military base out in the desert, right? So uh, she gives him a, ends up giving him a lift in to town and you know, thing and stuff ensues. But as you can see, most of my comics that are just awesome aren't going to be in great quality, except for except for one. As you see, some spine wear there, and <laughs> serious serious spine wear. Um, not to mention creases in the cover and foxing and whatnot. But you know, it back in the day uh, in the '90s when I was really really collecting comic books, uh, finding them digitally was a it just it just wasn't you you weren't going to be able to. Um, Getting a lot of collections. Yes, it's Dopio. Thank you. <laughs> it's Dopio. Um, finding them out in the wild, you know, it, it was a tough thing. But something that was happening a lot were comic book conventions. And there was a real big spike, real big boost in comic book readership uh, in the early 90s. Uh, there were a few things that happened there. You had the death of Superman. Was that around 92? You had... Uh, a resurgence in the X-Men, and that was thanks to Jim Lee taking over the art uh, work on that. Uh, Chris, Chris Claremont was still writing at that point, but he was, uh, he'd was he been doing it for a while. And I mean, it's great and everything, but you needed kind of a, uh, a fresh look on things. And so that's what Jim Lee provided. And Jim Lee, now, of course, talking about uh, the comic company sharing folk, he, he does Batman, like a lot of Batman. Uh, what was it? Uh, Hush, right? I haven't read a lot of Batman recently. I haven't read a lot of anything recently just because it's, it becomes cost prohibitive. Right. And I mean, there's, there's, there's too much other stuff to worry about. Well, Captain Marvel is notable um, because the original Captain Marvel, male Captain Marvel, Marvel, the original Kree, um, who incidentally had it ended up having a romantic thing with Carol Danvers in the books. And she did take over the mantle as Captain Marvel uh, after after Captain Marvel passed. Now, Captain Marvel being a, a, a unique individual, uh, a unique comic, um, and of course, Jim Starlin was writing those The uh, at that point. Um, he's the same guy that ended up doing uh, the Infinity Gauntlet and stuff when that came back. Um, but Captain Marvel died of cancer. Captain Marvel didn't, you know, wasn't, wasn't killed by some great enemy essentially on the field or anything like that. He fought this dude, I think his name was Nitro, and Nitro uh, gave off a lot of radiation, and this radiation ended up giving Captain Marvel cancer, and Captain Marvel ended up wasting away. So one of their first Marvel graphic novels was The Death of Captain Marvel, uh, which is actually up on that shelf. Why don't I go get that? Then This will make talking about that a little easier. Trying not to knock things. Out. All right, so here it is: the death of Captain Marvel, right? And of course, that's death. Uh, death is a character in the Marvel universe. Uh, death is uh, Thanos's main squeeze, I guess you'd call her. Um, but like, he's he's like super got a crush on her, kind of a thing, and she's all like, whatever, for the longest time. But she's still like, well, I guess I guess this dude's worth something, so I might as well let him tag along a little bit. So that that was kind of the relationship with Death and Thanos there. As you can see, um, this takes place after Thanos was, uh, you know, turned to stone essentially and just kind of dead. And th he stayed in this state for another ten good ten years um, before they were able to revive Thanos. But this 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 book is really about. Uh, people in the Marvel universe, uh, the, the, the main characters, the superheroes, uh, coming to terms with his death, death, um, saying their goodbyes to him before he passed on his deathbed and just, you know, kind of reflecting on, on everything that they go through and whatnot and the, uh, and how he touched everybody's lives. So that, I mean, it's, it, it was kind of a big and heavy thing for Marvel to do at the time. And that's just, that's just when I, it, example of 
uh, Marvel versus DC, not everything is going to be, you know, clean cut. You can't say, oh, the writing is all great in DC and Marvel has the art. You can't, you can't just make those distinctions because there are different writers, different artists on both sides, and they all, they all contribute in their own way. But to talk about, uh, let, uh, to talk about other things here, let's talk about other comics outside of uh, Marvel and DC and ones that, uh, Yeah, yeah, uh, De exactly, Tim. She's like, De Death is just like, yeah, wh whatever. She just just stone faces him the whole time. And maybe once in a while, like, she glares at him. But, I mean, that's that's really the only emotion you get to read there. Um, I did not grab issue number one for some reason. But Valiant Comics, which uh, late 80s, early 90s, made a big, big, you know, play at a... a at a wide open comic market, okay? Everybody's buying a lot of issues. Everything is great. Uh, for Marvel and DC, uh, like I said, Death of Superman, X-Men Resurgence, things like that, just really, you know, kicked up the game a lot, brought in a lot of new readership. And back then, I mean, see the price there, 250, which was still kind of expensive. Everybody else was doing, you know, $1.25 at that time. Hey, Hooded One, what's going on? But what what these independent companies had going for them is a lot of the um, big hitters from Marvel and DC were kind of branching out. Uh, Image, when that company started, uh, it was Marvel artists who just wanted to have creative control over their own characters, you know. So you had uh, Mark Silvestri, uh, Jim Valentino, uh, Eric Larson, Todd McFarlane famously, and uh, Jim Lee, and they they all, oh, and Rob LeFeld. I won't even talk about that, dude. Yes, yes. Um, death in a relationship with you click? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I could see it happening. I could see it happening. But bring out Archer and Armstrong, because this is, this is a case where the art and the story are uh, Barry Windsor Smith. You know, it's one individual. So it's not that uh, thing where, you know, person sends off their work for somebody else to interpret. This this is all through the single filter. So when you when you can find stories like this, they they resonate a little bit more. They have a little bit more coherence. Uh, there, are, there are less little mistakes that could be made, especially back in the day. Like people would, you know, miscolor something or... Um, draw something a little bit funky, you know, every, every maybe 50 issues that you read, you find a little, little flub in there or something like that. Um, but Marvel and DC didn't have a lot of people who did the writing and did, you know, I mean, Jim, Jim Starlin being the exception. Uh, and that's, that's why we love him here so much at Don Brickle's productions. Jim Starlin uh, was the person who really just fleshed out so much of the Marvel cosmic universe uh, initially back in the day with, with Captain Marvel, with his warlock reinvention, retooling. Um, and of course, later with the infinity gauntlet. Uh, snowing in the Netherlands. Yeah, we just had some rain this morning, which was weird and a little bit chilly. Uh, elevators not worthy. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Don Brickles productions. So yeah, we're, we were talking about death of Captain Marvel, uh, talking about Jim Starlin. And yeah, that's why it says at the bottom by Jim Starlin because he wrote and drew this, right? And I'm trying to keep Lego from falling while we're talking comic books here a little bit. Um, so the thing today is, you know, just uh, a lot of people have a Marvel versus DC preference. Uh, and so we're just trying to speak to that a little bit and let folks know where I fall on the subject. And I'm, I'm just saying like chat, you guys can go wild and uh, debate anything that you want to today. I'll chime in, try to, try and try and be up on things. And I just kind of want to show off my comic book collection a little bit because I, I still haven't come up with, with anything for my two week challenge for uh, Trick Bricks yet and the clock is ticking. Uh, I've had a few ideas and they've been dismissed uh, summarily. But um, yeah, um, <laughs> um I'm still trying to find inspiration, right? So I was playing like Shadow of Colossus yesterday. I'm just like bringing out some old stuff to see if it'll spark anything. Like, yeah, that, you know what? That would be a good idea. 
but still nothing, still nothing. I mean, I, I, I've got a little, little kernel of an idea that might be something, but we'll, we'll see if looking through any of this stuff kind of helps that out. Another company, <laughs> and this is more Barry Windsor Smith here because he's, he's all in the same thing. Now, Barry Windsor Smith, uh, I do have over here some, uh, some of the X-Men issues that uh, he did. Uh, he did, he did it. He did a few. Uh, his first book with Marvel actually was X Men, uh, number fifty three, I think, where Blastar comes into it. So yeah, um, and he ended up doing like the Conan books uh, back in the in the day, uh, making him kind of a viable character, right? So uh, one of the things too is before Marvel and DC became superhero comic book uh, things, the the main genres of comic book back in the day where you had your westerns, you had your romance, sometimes you had a little bit of sci-fi, and then horror, right? Th those were the kind of things. And so they, they dealt with more uh, more personal, more real-life kind of situations that people could get into, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was kind of half thinking about building one of the Colossi from Shadow of the Colossus, but I don't I don't have nearly the uh, the equipment to do that right now. Because they're they're massive. Plus, I mean, there's a lot of fur that you got to grab onto to climb up those things, right? And then, but yeah, yeah, I don't I don't have a good way to do that. Like it would it would be awesome if I could do it with say uh, little branch pieces, something like this, all right? If I had the right colors for it. But uh, I don't know. It, it just didn't seem quite feasible. And I mean, I've already gone down the Colossi road with with Galactus. And, Bigger figures like that, which I don't know if you can know. You can't see him between the buildings. He's, he's tucked back in there from this. This Build a small Colossus. Yeah, I could do a micro scale, a mini scale. Um, but yeah, I, I made my way through like seven or eight of them yesterday. And I didn't really find any of them appealing. They were actually kind of upsetting me a little bit. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Maybe I won't make you guys. How about that? Uh, but the game company that makes that, I, I still have The Last Guardian to play, which I was waiting for for like eight years to come out, and then it comes out. And then I play it for like 20 minutes, and then I set it aside because I'm working on something else. So I, I've got to go back to that. Um, but Ico, Ico was actually one of my first mocks, uh, one of my longest surviving mocks. And just to give you an idea of the, the wide variety of the world of comics here, um, here is something from Epic Comics, which is a subprint of Marvel, kind of like Vertigo was for DC. Uh, this is Stray Toasters by Bill Sinkovich. And what really jazzed me with reading comic books, I mean, story, yeah, but um, the art style, the art style for some of these folks. Like, you have your traditional, you know, drawn thing, and then you have stuff like Bill Sinkovich here would do. Right? which is uh, much more painterly, you know? Um, and he, he writes some of his stuff too, but he, he's, he's done, you know, your traditional line drawings. Yeah, it is a weird one. It is a weird one. Uh, Street Toasters is a good story. And actually, <laughs> there's, there's some other stuff going on in here that I can't really show, but yeah, it's, it's more of an uh, adult geared comic book. And there were little bits of holdouts of these uh, for the longest time. Even so much as to have something like this, rock and roll comics, right? Where they would tell the biography or the backstory of certain individuals in, in the music industry. Uh, there was, I think I had the Doors comic at one point. Like they, they've gone through and done like a lot of folks. But it's, uh, you know, just, just another little piece of the history there. Now here's something that really captured my ima imagination back in the day. Okay, so I already talked about Image and Valiant Comics and how they were kind of upstarts in the early 90s uh, to, to Marvel and DC because they had, they had stolen a lot of their, you know, big names, their big hitters, right? And so these uh, Marvel and DC are just kind of left treading water for a little bit while the dust kind of settles and, you know, see if, see if these uh, upstart companies make a go of it. And so uh, Image and Valiant, to Deathmate, which is a super huge crossover between the two. Um, and the, the crossover, of course, was in the individual titles. It was also in um, the main Deathmate storyline. And there were different colors for the for the main books. Uh, I think there's red. 
I got them all right here. Why am I, why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Um, and of course, they they went back and forth on who published the books and who provided the art and story for them, right? So, so you have like Deathmate Yellow here, which is of course done by it's a Valiant uh, book, and these are four ninety five. So and the thicker stock on the outside, it's Mr. Mirage there, and you know they they prop their own characters up. There's Deathmate Blue, right? And they they had uh, old uh, what was it? Golden Key Comics, I think it was, had a few characters that, that they had ended up picking up. So like Solar, Man of the Atom, and uh, Magnus Robot Fighter was one of them. And then that's where Bloodshot came from. I mean, there's there's something for you Vin Diesel fans there. <laughs> and this is Rob Liefeld. Uh, now, Rob Liefeld, I'm not the biggest fan of, mostly because look at those feet. Just like, dude, come on, man. Observe life a little bit more, right? But he he was a very stylized guy, and he actually got his big break when he did New Mutants. Uh, he finished up New Mutants uh, somewhere like eighty, some like late eighties, all the way up to issue one hundred. And then New Mutants became X Force, and then he stayed with that until somewhere around issue 15, 16, somewhere just north of there. And then that's when Image broke off. Those guys broke off and did Image. And then he started Youngblood, which which was a thing. I mean, people at that time went gaga for Youngblood. And something else these had too, they had a prologue and an epilogue. And they were a little bit cheaper than the than the main one. They were like so the $2.95 each. So they're more affordable. But as you can see here, we got the Joe, is that Joe? Yeah. Joe Casada art. Which is absolutely fantastic. One of my favorite favorite artists of ever. Yeah, Batman crosses over with everybody hooded one. That was that was one of the the things for me. But I mean, I will tell you what though, Batman and Grendel crossover. Uh, Grendel's another non Marvel or DC character. Uh, Grendel was creation of Matt Wagner, uh, who is fantastic, phenomenal, does really great stuff. Uh, he's done work for Marvel and DC, but he's. Uh, He's done a lot of his own characters and stuff like that. So Grendel being like the main one, if you can find it, read Grendel, get down with Grendel, especially the Hunter Rose version of Grendel. Fantastic. Hey, Joel Marbella, what's going on? He of many names, Joel. Yes, Grendel. Grendel is the bomb, yo. Like Hunter Rose is just like the smoothest cat of all time. And Grendel is, well, when you first really see Grendel, uh, it's like, Hunter Rose's adopted daughter really taking up the mantle and then they, he kind of goes back in a little bit and fills in bits and pieces here and there. I think there was a, like an original three issue run for the Hunter Rose stuff. Then like 30 or 40 issues of uh, the female Grendel. I didn't get many of those unfortunately. They were tougher to find for me. Uh, and then he went back and filled in a lot of holes and I mean there's Grendel Prime stuff in the future and so yeah, Matt Matt Wagner is the bomb. Yes, and I went through a thing a few years back where I tried to get rid of as many things as I could in here, right? Because I I had accumulated so much shizzle in my lifetime that I just had to offload it somehow, right? So I made, and this was not really a New Year's resolution, but it, it, it happened to coincide. So I was like, all right. I'm going to give myself one year. I'm going to see if I can get rid of a thousand different things. So I had notebooks and I, you know, made sure to write things down. And that was selling different things. That was throwing out items that I was just holding on to for no good reason whatsoever. Right. And so I just kind of got in the habit of it and got on a roll with it. And I started selling the comic books that I had. Like I had stuff that my, well, let me say my main comic book store back in the day had a, had a dime bin. Okay, and this guy would just pull like overstock. He didn't really care what it was, what the title was. So he, there'd be X books in there, X Men, um, X Force, X Factor, uh, all that stuff. Some New Mutants, uh, any any and everything under the sun that he had sitting underneath his main tables. He would just just go through there randomly and throw in there. And I got a few extra copies of X Men number two and some other stuff. Oh. But yeah, uh, so having accumulated so many comics over the span of probably five or six years of intense comic book collecting, 
uh, I really had to end up paring it down to, to make it so a, we could, you know, think about moving from the apartment because if I, if I tried to take everything that I had at that point, it just wouldn't work. So my goal was to get rid of a thousand things, you know, and we're talking action figures and all that because I had power of the force star Wars collection. That was insane. Um, the Marvel t toy biz characters from back in the day, uh, a lot of them, thanks to toy biz and their three for 10 deals and things like that. Uh, so a lot of that stuff had to end up just going because I didn't have any place to display it. And uh, they were all loose figures because they had been on display at some point. So um, by the end of the year, you know, keeping a tally, running tally of everything, I had gotten rid of like 3,127 or something like that, different things, you know. So I was able to reduce my comic book collection quite a bit. I got rid of a lot of my uncanny X-Men, which I do kind of regret a little bit now because we're talking, we're talking good stuff back then. I kept a few of the issues that I really love, some key issues, but yeah, mo most of it ended up going. But like the stuff I have in these small boxes here, I do have a few long boxes uh, as well, but the stuff I have in here are like the creme de la creme, right, for me. Uh, this is your Marvel Cosmic stuff. This is your Fantastic Four, Captain Marvel, which we've seen in here. Uh, some of the Warlock books, uh, some Valiant titles like uh, Archer and Armstrong is my favorite there. Yeah, yeah, Nightfall. Yeah, the, I mean the whole the whole thing with Batman. There were there were so many things, and I'm sure you y'all you, remember uh, what was that Osriel? who took over for Batman for a little bit when Batman's back was broken and all that good stuff. And that character got huge for a hot second. And then, you know, petered on out. Uh, and I still need to catch up on Falcon and the winter soldier because I'm kind of hoping that one of the characters from my youth that I really loved, uh, that was Captain America related, which at that time certainly wasn't Captain America. Uh, it was nomad and nomad was like the second or third Bucky, uh, Jack Monroe had, broken out and gone and doing doing his own thing super cool guy wearing a trench coat you know had the had the hair and glasses and stuff and he was and it was drawn by samuel clark hallbaker which did an amazing job with that and they just looked fantastic i hadn't seen anything that looked that awesome but uh yeah Az azrael did did look very very cool um and uh a lot of that i like to credit with uh joe Quesada, joe Quesada for for that but I, i'm a little bit biased towards the guy what can i say he's he's the only uh comic artist i actually have their original artwork for two pages of marvel comics unlimited number one that i bought off him at a convention uh wizard world chicago uh pretty decent price and if you know joe Casada, you know he works with jimmy palmiotti uh doing his inks a lot but this is like a rare instance where joe did his own inks so when, when i went to get it signed um and I had Joe Casada sign it after, of course, I gave over the money for getting the pages. And he's like, yeah, sure, man. Here you go. And then Jimmy was like, had his hand. I was like, hey, you want me to sign it? I was like, oh, dude, and like this is the one case like you didn't actually ink the stuff. And he was like shocked. He was like, oh. so anyway, anyway, there was a, there was a thing. All right. So take a look at another short box. Let's see who we got here. Okay. And there's there's more Warlock and Infinity stuff in here, too. But as you all know, um, there's a thing called the Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Well, the Guardians of the Galaxy that is out now, um, what was it, around 2008, 2013? I, I'm not sure because I didn't read them. Uh, when when Star-Lord and that crew kind of got together. Now, the Drax I know, the Drax I grew up with, was a totally different Drax the Destroyer. Um, same for Gamora. Gamora was a little bit, little bit different. Um, she, she presented herself a lot differently. I'll, I'll say that. Well, we might see her a little bit later on in these stacks. Um, but some of the I had Guardians number one from like what is this volume three or something like that from from back in the day. But I've got these ones uh, for a very specific reason because you know Guardians of the Galaxy is in the twenty fifth century or something like that. Twenty third, thirty first century. Sorry. Right there at the top, <laughs> 31st century. Um, so, you know, my all-time favorite character is Silver Surfer, right? So Silver Surfer ends up popping up in these as the Keeper. Now, he's got the Quantum Bands there. He's got all kinds of extra stuff going on. He's just more than the Silver Surfer, 
we know now, right? And then eventually the Guardians of the Galaxy show down with Galactus because, you know, of course they're going to. And these are a lot of characters down here. You see old school Yondu with that super huge fin, Charlie 27. Uh, he was played by, uh, oh, what's that cat's name? Ving Rhames. He was he was Ving Rhames in the little bits of the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and then uh, yeah, other other folks there, Fire Lord and whatnot. But yeah, this 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 was this was a piece of history. This was the Guardians of the Galaxy before the Guardians of the Galaxy became as you know them now. And even then, I guess I, I was looking up things the other day, and it turns out that the roster changes frequently with the new books. So it's just just too much for me to keep up with these days. And, of course, we have the origin story of Galactus in here, the old school thing. It's talking about Galen and how he uh, how he survived the, the last universe before our this most recent Big Bang when everything was coming in. And he uh, he was uh, he was a lone survivor somehow, like he was encased in in something. So, I mean, that, that that's how they explain. It. But, yeah, some some interesting stuff there. Of course, I got some Strange Tales issues in here. Let me just kind of make sure I keep everything. Let's see. Marvel Premiere featuring the Power of Warlock. Number two. Uh, oh, now this. This. This is when you really see Jim Starlin's art, like, take hold. You know, Strange Tales, 179. Just look at the way he does Adam Warlock there. That's just like super intense. Oh, Brickinista, we're we're still going through it. Thanks, though. Um, yeah, it's uh it is quite the collection. And then so this guy here, right? Uh he's actually a judge. But he is trapped in the soul gym with Adam Warlock, and that's a whole thing. Oh, the parable. Yeah, I've got that in here too. Uh, issues one and two. Yeah, that was that was that was a good one. That was a good one. Mo Mobius had just like fantastic artwork, and the way he approached uh, the Silver Surfer, uh, as far as appearance goes, is really minimalistic and fantastic. It's just really. Uh, Aquamite TV has returned. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, we're just taking a look at uh, Warlock stuff. And if you don't know who Adam Warlock is, um. He has been teased. Yes, uh, there we go. Yep, he's been teased in two Marvel films. Uh, he was teased in uh, Fantastic Four: Return of the Silver Surfer or Rise of the Silver Surfer, Silver Surfer and uh, at the end of Guardians Two. But the the origin of uh, Adam Warlock, who was Super Cocoon Baby, as we we all may or may not know him, um, was. Uh, it was really less auspicious. It was some Earthlings that were working on some things, and they ended up creating Adam Warlock. They wanted to create this like perfect being uh, who was going to be, you know, who was going to obey their every command and you know help them take over the world, kind of a thing. But it turns out, like, they created something with a conscience, and he was like, "No, nah, I ain't gonna do that." And then Adam Warlock, as he's known at that point as him, uh, gets taken. Or goes and does some things. He pops up later, and, and with the high high evolutionary, who ends up doing some things, and then he gets relaunched again. And I mean, it's it, the the character kind of goes back and forth a lot. Uh, Namor and Alanis, yeah, yeah. Um, Namor is an extremely old character. Um, Namor is, I believe, one of the three oldest Marvel characters. Uh, props to anybody who can give us give us the other two. But Prince Prince Namor, he's he's kind of a, a he's an interesting character because like he didn't begin as a good guy. Like same with Black Widow and Hawkeye, they didn't begin as good guys. They began as, of course, adversaries. Um, well, the original Namor was different, but when uh, Stanley reintroduced Namor in uh, in the Fantastic Four series, it was one of the very early issues. I'm not even going to throw a number out there, um, but yeah, he was he was uh, you know his world was Atlantis, and 
you know, the humans, the air breathers were trying to do their thing and like he wasn't having it. So he's like trying to protect his stuff. Namor is hated by everyone except true Marvel fans. The same can be said of Aquaman. The same can be said of Aquaman. Now you will find a lot of people out there who are DC fans who will say that Aquaman is, you know, shouldn't be. Um, because, I mean, they're essentially the same person, right? They talk to fish. They talk to fish. They live under the sea. I mean, it's 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 like SpongeBob with different pants, right? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I do have a softer spot in my heart for Namor versus uh, Aquaman. But that's just that, that's just old, old stuff there. OK, now here's some here's here's a little bit of history. Yeah, Aquaman is a true hero. I, I understand. Yeah, I, I, I like to kid Aquaman a lot just because he I mean, I, everybody is lampooned Aquaman a little bit for for the whole fish thing. Um, but Nick Fury is a character everybody's familiar with, of course. Well, here is early Nick Fury as agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> fighting Hydra. Um, I have this because I think this is like the first appearance of Living Tribunal or somebody makes a shows up in here. Um, let's see. There. There's Marvel Team Up 55, Spider Man <laughs> Warlock. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Aquaman. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I, I know, I know, Aquaman is your thing, and I've, I've taken a lot of, a lot of stuff for being a Silver Surfer fan over the years. I mean, because I mean, he has no pants, right? Or nowadays, at least he's not presented with any pants. Jack Kirby drew him with pants, or at least you know shorts. But how can you really tell if, it, if it's shorts? He just essentially had a waistline and then two lines on the thighs to indicate that he was wearing something. Because, I mean, people just weren't going to accept it. He had a, uh, there was there was a bulge without much there. And here is an uh, earlier version of Mantis, who you might know. There. Ooh, okay. Now here's, here, now we're getting into the nitty gritty. People who know Incredible Hulk, people who know what's coming up after these issues are going to be like, oh, why didn't you just go a little bit further and get the other ones? Well, because they're insanely expensive. That's why. Um, but we have Adam Warlock essentially coming in, uh, ma making a big play against against Hulk here. But, and so this this was like a, a new resurgence of Adam Warlock. And it was, it was a good time. But those who know... You see our issues in there are number 177 and 178. Those who know what's coming up in the next three or four issues of the Hulk here um, might get a little excited because <laughs> Wolverine is not far away. All right, but I don't have those, of course. Now, what I do have, here's a little bit of old school Namor action for you. And Na Namor also, I mean, he's he's got wings on his feet. Not necessarily the coolest thing in the world, but he can fly, which is, which is the thing. Yes, yeah, Wolverine. Wolverine coming up, uh, was it 179, 180, and 181? Because I, I think he was like cameo in one and then full appearance, and then the story continued in the, in the third. Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually missed that Aqua Mike, so I'm gonna have to watch it again and pick it up. But those who know know this issue. This is Iron Man 55. Okay, there's a lot going on here. You see there, that is the original Drax, Drax the Destroyer. Back when Drax was a smart guy, um, Drax went through some stuff and had suffered some brain damage, so Drax essentially became stupid later in the day. Um, and the Drax that we see at the Guardians of the Galaxy is kind of a different Drax entirely from this person. This person person was an Earthling that uh, had some stuff happen and became Drax. But this is also this is also the first appearance of Thanos. I open this and see if I can find it. All right. And 
again, with all my comics, especially the ones back in the day, I just really was after reading copies. So you can see the condition here is, is nothing great for these. But yeah, the Blood Brothers are the two main characters on the front there, and they are controlled by uh, Thanos. Tracks there. Yep, and there's there he is in the shadows. This cat right there is Thanos. So even in this condition, this is still a sought after book. And I believe there's there are another couple characters here to the pop-up in this one, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk it and start rifling through there and damage things possibly. Whoa, sorry. But I'm just going to skim through here, see if there are any, okay. Thor number 132, first appearance of Ego, uh, also from Guardians movies. Of course, Thor being an Asgardian, he gets around, so he's fought Galactus. And looking there. Oh, and check this out. Apparently, Galactus is wearing shorts, y'all. Look at that. Actually, no, he's not wearing shorts. He's uh, he's not wearing any pants. Because, um, yeah, that's kind of a skirt that comes down from the top. So, I wonder what kind of morning Galactus had there. I mean, that, that can't be good. It's, that's like a nightmare scenario. He's probably like, oh, my God, I can't believe I walked out of the house with no pants. Ego, ego, the purple planet. Yeah, ego, ego, the living planet. Uh, he's 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 got a lot of purple action going on for sure. Um, yeah. All right. So yeah, there's there's some classics there. Uh, and then we have uh, Fire Lord here, who is a, another uh, herald of Galactus who came on the scene. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, you want to hit me up with anything. Have have I ever sent my any of my books to be graded? No. No, I haven't because I don't really have anything. Well, I have one um, and maybe we'll see that, but I don't really have anything that would be worth it really because it's like 40 or 40. Well, back in the day, it was like 40 or 50 bucks to, to send them off to the CGC to have them graded and put into a little case and never to be opened again. And that, excuse me. And that, and that's one of the reasons why I haven't too, because I had, I got these books to read. I didn't really get them necessarily for the collectability, although most of them are. Um, I got them to read because it was insanely tough to find these stories back in the day. And so this is this is the only outlet you had. I mean, let's see where I'm at here. Here's another first appearance. This one, this one's actually pretty, pretty tasty. Uh, Marvel Premiere 15, Iron Fist. First time. There's Deadpool. Okay, here, here's a good team up. Aunt May and Franklin Richards versus Galactus. Weird, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Contest of Champions. Da da da. Hercules. And here, another another serious issue. Marvel presents number eight, Guardians of the Galaxy, with the Silver Surfer. I don't know. Iron Iron Fist. Iron Fist. I enjoyed Iron Fist more than I did Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones just seemed to be like a super powered alcoholic who occasionally saved the day through uh, through a haze of. Inebriation. <laughs> so, so in that light, I, I gave Iron Fist a little bit more. But my favorite of that, of course, was uh, Luke Cage, Power Man. Dude, yeah. Here we go. Getting to the big buck books now. Silver Surfer number one. Uh, not the first appearance of the Silver Surfer, but this was the... F um, these Silver Surfer issues... Do I have any Micronauts? I don't have any Micronauts. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have any Micronauts. I do have a couple issues of Rom Space Knight. You've all seen Rom in the cheap bins, I'm sure, back in the day. Um, but yeah, so the thing about the Silver Surfer books, you can see they're visibly thick from back in the day because the story was, they went a little bit more with it. They, they cost more than your average comic book. Um, 
and not necessarily, I don't know. They were good. They were good issues, but like at this point in time, Silver Surfer was trapped on Earth, right? He was he was pretty much caught within a certain, you know, distance from Earth. And if he went beyond that, Galactus had a barrier set up that would zap him and you know send him crashing back down. Uh definitely the Silver Surfer is my my favorite hero of the Galactus. Uh but outside of the Silver Surfer, Nova was fun. Um Terax was cool. Uh Fire Lord, a little bit of a douche, honestly. And this one, if it didn't have this huge crease going down the cover, would actually be a, a tasty issue, right? Uh, as, it, as it was, this, this wasn't cheap for me back in the day. But yeah, Silver Surfer number four. Four versus the Silver Surfer. And so we go back through here and I mean there there are 18 issues of that original run of Silver Surfer. Um and initially it was Stanley and uh John Basima who did the art for it which fantastic fantastic artwork and Silver Surfer was also uh a member of the Defenders he teamed up with uh with the other cats there and the Defenders are initially weren't what you saw on the uh, on the TV show. I mean, it wasn't Jessica Jones, uh, Power Man, Iron Fist, and uh, Daredevil. It was um, it was Prince Namor, uh, Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, uh, and the Hulk. So that that was your your team back in the day. And Silver Surfer didn't come in initially; like he he was second second step in. And then, of course, Marvel did a thing in the late 90s because they were still on the big kick of getting everybody to, uh, you know, get down with the Infinity stuff. So they did the Cosmic Power series where they kind of spotlighted individual folks. And the stories kind of all came together. But you see there one of the best artists ever to do Silver Surfer or Thanos or uh, really any cosmic stuff, you know, next to Jim Starlin was Ron Lim. Ron Lim made the Silver Surfer for me. Like he was the artist who was drawing it when I picked it up. And his illustrations were just fantastic. Um, yeah, just just amazing stuff. So Thanos had a series. Terax is here. Terax, uh, another later herald of Galactus, who's a little bit more gruff. I mean, let's face it. Uh, I think Galactus ended up picking up him because, like, he was all kinds of. I just really don't care. I'm going to find you a planet. I don't care who's on it. Uh, Jack of Hearts. Uh, in Ganymede. Uh, Jack of Hearts was another character. He had uh, certain cosmic powers and we'll not to talk too much about him. They were they were really trying to push him in with everybody else. But yeah, Ron Lim was the bomb. Ron Lim still is the bomb. Uh, Ron Lim actually, I believe, went to the Silver Surfer uh, from Captain America, which got me to read a couple Captain America comics back in the day. But, I mean, the art was fantastic. The writing I I don't think binary was. I mean, she, she, uh, Carol Danvers. She may have like stepped in and done a little bit, but Nova Nova was a Galactus Herald, uh, who was Frankie Ray. Frankie Ray was her name. She kind of came up in the uh, Fantastic Four books. She was a flame. Yeah, she was a flame uh, of Johnny Storm back in the day. Uh, and actually, she is in the uh, Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. She was a character that was uh, oh, like some kind of military colonel or not colonel, probably like a lieutenant, something like that. Stardust. Yeah, they, these are my my comic knowledge, especially of the, the main universes kind of ends around 2000 because that's kind of when I stopped being able to afford comics. Uh, and keep it all in line with video game habits and movies and music and uh, other toys, eventually Lego that I was starting to buy more and more of, uh, you know, as time went on. So I, I'm going to have to do some catching up and check out the Stardust. But I see Legacy. Yeah. Morg was another Herald of Galactus, which, I mean, yeah, you know, another one of those violent cats where Galactus just, Silver Surfer was the first, and 
the Silver Surfer gave Galaxus the idea to have heralds, people to go hunt on the planets. So technically, I mean, Silver Surfer is responsible for anything that those cats end up doing. So let's see, got past that, defenders. There's Tyrant. There's another tool. And of course, they kept doing it. Cosmic Powers Unlimited with Silver Surfer. Well, what's in the last bit of this box here? This is this is the gold stuff. Thanos Quest. This is Thanos going after the Infinity Stones. <laughs> Modoc. Yeah, Modoc was Morgan Mindy. <laughs> Oh, uh, now see, I would have watched that. I would, I would totally have watched that. Nanu, nanu. But uh, yeah, and see, there you go. Jim Starlin, Ron Lim. Can't beat that. You can't beat that. So, so the people that uh, Thanos originally went and got the uh, Infinity Stones from were the Elders of the Universe. Um, they were the Elders of the Universe because they were last surviving uh, member of their planet. Um, Usually because Galactus came in and did something or, you know, some big bad came in and wiped out the entire population, something like that. So they were like death had made sort of a deal or a pact that the, the, the last remnant of these societies would, would pretty much be more immortal. Uh, and that made them good candidates to uh, to shepherd the Infinity Stones because, I mean, they're they weren't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. And actually people have tried to kill elders. They may have taken out their corp corporeal body, um, but their spirits still survived. Mr. Fantastic versus Plastic Man. I'm going to go Mr. Fantastic because Mr. Fantastic also has this going for him, um, which, which is definitely, which is definitely a big plus. I mean, Plastic Man is a little bit more there. There's another Marvel character called the impossible man. Uh, and what the impossible man did was he, like, he was this pink and green guy who could pretty much become anything, but he was a real joker. Um, and he was an alien. He would come in and just do all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, and, and that, and that's kind of how I, I see plastic, man. Um, yeah. Dark seed, dark side versus Thanos, Thanos, Thanos without stones, Thanos, um, Thanos, uh, the movies, the movies give you kind of a weird conception of Thanos, right? Um, because Thanos has a weapon, a big, huge weapon that he's wielding. But Thanos doesn't need a weapon. Thanos can shoot energy from his hands. Okay, that's that's and super strong, right? He's he's a Titan. He's he's from the Moon Titan, so he's technically a Titan. Um, but he has powers. Thanos has powers. Uh, Thanos doesn't need a huge blade to like throw and whip at somebody. Thanos doesn't need you know, to physically buck down with the Hulk. Thanos can just blast the, you know, stuff out of him from, from a distance. Uh, and that's something else that plays into Dr. Doom versus Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange has more, uh, like, the crazy thing between that matchup, Aqua Mike, is um, Dr. Doom does have a little bit of the mystic arts underneath his belt. Dr. Doom is just, like, kind of a, a ultra baddie, really. Um, dictator, um, brilliant scientist, pretty handy with the mystical arts. So he's, he's got his, you know, figuratively, he's got his hands in a lot of pies. He can do a lot of different things. Like, um, he, he's not anybody to mess with, but, but Dr. Strange being Dr. Strange can kind of vision versus red tornado. Yeah, that's, um, let's see here. For that, I'm going to have to say Vision. For sure. Vision all the way. Um, a red tornado. Yeah. Now, the, the thing about a lot of those um, second and third tier DC characters is they, they feel a whole lot more like second and third tier characters. Okay, um, The Marvel stuff, sometimes they can go a little bit deeper. But, I mean, even, even if it's like somebody like Fire Lord. Uh, he still feels a little bit more fleshed out than some of the, you know, next level DC stuff to me, to me at least, you know, 
And that's that's not saying that I'm I'm hating on DC. Um, and I actually do kind of like Aquaman a little bit. I, I I will tell you that Aqu Aquaman's got charm for me. Really, he does. Uh, as a kid, I I had some. Uh, I had only a handful of like they were called Mego action figures. They were like huge and they're kind of like the Barbie doll of uh, action figures for boys because you could dress them up. They had clothes. Uh, you could switch things out. So one of the first ones I had was I had Aquaman back in the day. And I also had some Star Trek ones. So like Aquaman would frequently be on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, you know, kicking it with Spock and Kirk and Sulu. Uh, Martian Manhunter versus Vision. Mm, that's a tough one because John Jones is at BMF. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guess what the BMF stands for. But yeah, I, lo I love me some John Jones. And when and when they came out with the uh, uh, the the primo figure for him, I jumped up on that so quick. So yeah, Th Thanos quest. Thanos is going through get collecting the stones from the elders of the universe, and he's got to defeat them in like each one's you know specialty. Um, Power stone he's got to take from the champion. Uh, Soul gem is the toughest one, of course. Soul gem he's got to travel to the soul world. I mean, there's, cause yeah, there's there's a soul world inside the soul gym that, so won't go too deep off into that. But I mean, there's the runner, there's uh, oh, the gardener, uh, contemplator, Wonder Woman versus Black Widow, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman. She's got the Larry Lasso of truth and such. She just, she just, I don't know. She, she comes from kind of a different place from Black Widow. Because Black Widow, like I said original, earlier, I said originally Black Widow and uh, Hawkeye were villains. Okay. Uh, and that's how they came on the scene. And then, of course, over time, you know, they found their other ways and ended up joining the forces of good. Because, you know, that's the thing that happens in comic books. Wanda versus Wonder Woman. Well, I mean, at this point, are we talking Wanda in the comics? Because Wanda has a certain power limit that she can reach there. Whereas as she's per presented on the TV show, like she's pretty much unstoppable. Um, she is limited just by the, um, just by her uh, imagination, really. Uh, Thor versus Steel. Thor. Thor. Thor's a god, yo. Thor is a god. But you know the crazy thing about all these, you know. DC versus Marvel mashups or, or versus things is if you've ever read one of the uh, comic book <laughs> issues where they have like these crossovers, you know, it, uh, the cover makes it look like, oh, Superman is going to throw down with a silver surfer. That goes on for maybe two or three pages. And then, you know, they find a common ground. They have a common enemy. They have to band together, you know, to defeat this outside force. And, you know, it all, every, it, nothing really gets resolved is, is what goes on. Brainiac versus Ultron. Brainiac seems slightly less, I don't know, slightly less susceptible to defeat. I guess, I guess is what I'm saying there. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see. I'll try and get these back in order somehow here because the, the, the next stuff I've got is the crux of the issue at hand, right? Issue at hand is the Infinity Gauntlet. And it begins here. And I bought these off of the new shelf, when the when, new stand when they came out. Uh, I didn't get one and two right away because the first place I got it was like at a grocery store. And um, they, they didn't have the other issues. What they did have was Infinity Gauntlet number three. And I mean, look at that. Like everybody's going into rush, you know, take them on. We got Wolverine. We got everybody there. Wolfman Perez, Teen Titans versus Claremont, Burn, uh, X Men. Ooh, oh, uh, that's gonna be a tough call, but X Men all the way. God, that was quick. Sorry, that wasn't so tough at all for me. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do love me some Marv Wolfman. I, I, George Perez like holds a very special place in my heart. He, he really does. I mean, because I mean, this this is George Perez art right here. Uh, he did. Uh, first couple issues of the Infinity Gauntlet, and then Ron Lim ended up taking over. So, and I mean, it, it, their their art styles are fantastic and complementary to each other. Uh, Black Manta versus Black Panther. Black Panther, con forever. And my, I just want to say too, uh, my favorite Marvel movies aren't necessarily the Avengers movies, Iron Man or Thor. No, 
I, I do love me some Guardians. I love me some Guardians all day. I watch that over and over again. I watch Guardians 2 like four or five times a week ago. Um, but Doctor Strange and Captain Marvel, they're my top two. And then and then Black Panther because Black Panther. Uh, and I actually got to see the Lexus um, that was in Black Panther when I went to the Peterson Museum out in uh, L.A. They had uh, like uh, a sci-fi and comic movie um display going on in the main floor so they had batmobile they had mad max's car they had uh luke's land speeder they had the probe 16 which is the car that uh alex drove in clockwork orange the durango 95 um there were there were a lot of them there they were stuff from minority report there was stuff from ai in there uh just all these fantastic vehicles they had the King Cobra from the very opening scene of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where uh, Quill's mom and uh, Ego are driving through the, you know, the Missouri countryside in that, that nice turquoise Mustang. That was there. I got to see that Mustang. I got, to, I got to breathe on that Mustang, which is about as close as I could get to it. Like I may have mentioned before when I was at that museum, I did have my own security detail because I spent far too long and got far too close to the Nissan R390. That's a different thing. All right, so you got your Infinity Gauntlet. It's a six issue run and good things. Uh, the story goes much differently than the Avengers Endgame and Infinity War and stuff like that. Uh, it, it ends up Nebula, right? Ends up getting a hold of the Infinity Gauntlet at, at the end of the thing, which what a twist. Vulture versus Dove, Vulture. Dick Tracy versus Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck, all day. All day. Yeah. Uh, I've been a big fan of Howard the Duck since I saw the movie back as a kid. Um, haven't read too many of the comic books with him, but I got a couple. All right. And so after Infinity Gauntlet, you know, made so much for Marvel, they are like, let's keep going with this. So they had the Infinity War. Okay. And pretty much the same thing all over again. I mean, you know, people got stones. People want to fight people for the stones. Although this one's a little bit different because, like, the person who had the, the, the stones at that point was Magus, who was, like, an alternate version of Adam Warlock. And Adam Warlock in the Infinity Watch, which is Gamora and Pip and Moondragon and them and Drax, I think, they all end up, you know, safeguarding the stones and then something happened, betrayed them, whatnot. Um, yeah, so then you got your Infinity War, and that's this is Magus right here. Okay, and then so people were still buying that, people were still making money. They Marvel was doing a crossover with them, so like uh, any any of the characters that really showed up in these large Marvel events would have a crossover issue in their own titles. So there would be four or five issues of Silver Surfer, Doctor Strange, you name it where it was tied in directly to the Infinity War and Infinity Gauntlet. So they were trying to make that much more money off of it. Because, I mean, let, let's, 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 let's face it here. The comic thing, yes, they're great stories, but their intention, the reason they exist, is to make money. So that's, that's where a lot of the motivation for these storylines come from, and these big plays, right? Um, then they came back again and did the Infinity Crusade, which... Brings goddess in there, and you know a whole a whole another realm of things, and you know, like she had devotees and people who were you know turned over to her and things. So yeah, was I disappointed about Nebula not using the gauntlet in the movie? I was more disappointed by Nebula being reduced. Like she was in, in my eyes, she was like reduced as a character because the Nebula I knew, the Nebula that I grew up with. Uh, she was a bad pirate mama, yo. Like she was space pirate supreme. She was running crews and getting off to all kinds of nefarious stuff. And like she was like super smart and a serious adversary for a lot of folks. Uh, but it seemed like she ended up playing second fiddle to Gamora and of course second fiddle to Thanos uh, in the films. And Thanos just kind of had his way with with her a little bit, you know, changing over parts and stuff. And I mean. It, it, you got to assume that some folks are going to have cybernetic replacements in space. But, I mean, Nebula had hair, yo. Nebula had hair. 
Uh, I mean, as a ball person, I, I, I was like, cool, she, she's on my side, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, the, the character changed a little bit drastically for me. And I mean, it's Karen Gillian. So it's, I mean, Amy Pond is uh, fantastic. And I don't know, it, it just never really clicked for me so much. But the more and more I watch it, the more comfortable I get with it. But she's just like a little ball of rage in the movies. Um, yeah. But yeah, I am disappointed that she didn't end up using the gauntlet. I'm disappointed. Here's here you go, Aqua Mike. Here, here's one for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tried to get all the, the cosmic crossovers I could get. But yeah, I was uh and I even have a Galactus miniseries in here. Galactus the Devourer. Um but yeah, I was I was a little disappointed in the movies. I was mostly disappointed in how the gauntlet and its power was presented. Um, because Thanos got watered down because, you know, Thanos had to use blade and he didn't have, he wasn't blasting people with power, you know, doing, doing the thing he usually does. So he had to get up close and personal with folks. So that kind of watered him down a little bit. And then they ended up watering down the gauntlet because as, as Thanos went through Thanos quest here and acquired each gym, he had that power. He could, he could use that power and it didn't require finger snap or anything like that he just had access to it uh the only well he used the finger snap a couple times in infin come a uh, couple times in the infinity gauntlet but really it was just for show because you know thanos does things with a little bit of panache um so that's why the finger snap was there and of course he snapped when he got rid of half the population but for most of anything else he did gauntlet wise it because you have the mind gem there, you're you're essentially omniscient, um, omnipresent too. You, like there's nothing in the world that you're not aware of. So your access to the powers of the gauntlet are immediate, and you don't need to snap things. It's just a, as, as a thought. Like sometimes you you're making moves with that thing that you don't even consciously think of. You know, and that's one of the things that did Thanos. Um, Yellow jacket. Mm, yellow jackets okay yellow jackets yeah yeah the snap is for movie visuals and uh to give the heroes a way to defeat thanos because if he didn't need that snap how are they going to stop him they, they couldn't stop him i mean and if the gauntlet was the actual gauntlet uh thanos would have seen all the future stuff going on and you know, because he, he so, so many things, so many things, so many things about that, that I could, I could talk for a while, but yeah, it was, it was mostly for visuals in the movie. It was mostly to give them a way to defeat Thanos because in infinity gauntlet number three, the first one I got, like all the heroes had teamed up and gotten together, the ones who were still surviving and went after Thanos. They went and rushed him. Right. And so you got Captain America, you got the Hulk going after him. Uh, Iron Man and everybody and they're all just rushing at him but Thanos like he he actually toned down his powers a little bit to deal with these guys he's like all right you know I I'm gonna have a little bit of fun here and so like he encases uh Cyclops's head you know in just this cube where nothing can get out but I mean they're in space too and Doctor Strange did this one spell to where everybody would have like a certain amount of oxygen out there and so he was cut off from the oxygen. So he, he pretty much killed killed him with just encasing him in that. Uh, vision, he turned Vision into little cubes, like boop, just like ice cubes, like boom. Vision just broke apart. Uh, Wolverine came after him. He turned Wolverine's adamantium skeleton into jelly, essentially, right? So, you know, Wolverine just like flops and flops and he's done. He's out. Uh, Hulk, he smacked dog stuff out of Hulk and, you know, and Iron Man and everybody and Captain America, they they all fell to Thanos. Like there was nobody who could take him on. And that was even with his powers reduced. So the idea in the movie that, you know, they could everybody could rush Thanos and try and keep him from snapping his fingers while he's got the gauntlet on, it's just re, re, it's it's a bit of a stretch for me. It's a bit of a stretch. It's a little bit of a stretch. So let's see. Uh, Couple more issues I want to uh, take a look at here. 
just because I have them and they're cool things. I want to show them off because I never get to show this stuff off. But I do want to um, talk too about uh, Brickanisa and I are doing the rebrick this for the Cyber Drone set uh, three one 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 for uh, the Creator three and one. I'm going to be working on another one soon once I get table space back again in this room because I got I got to get this building done. This this is a thing I've got to figure that out. Um, the first thing I'm going to have to do is kind of just get the facade for it, and then once I get that, I can figure out where everything else is going. Yeah, going back in time for the stones. Yeah, and I was thinking that earlier this morning too about uh, the ancient one when when the Hulk went to age and wanted to get the time stone and, and everything there, and that was that was a little bit cool. But yeah, <sighs> this is uh, yeah. I don't know. I could I could I could talk smack about it endlessly. So we got in the box. What's in the box? I'll tell you what's in the box. The Fantastic Four. Now you can see this issue is pretty beat up. Um, issue number 44 here is the first appearance of Gorgon, one of the uh, one of the Inhumans. And the Inhumans were like, I love the Inhumans. It's one of my favorite Marvel groups. Uh, I watched the uh, live action in humans and actually enjoyed it quite a bit. They were pretty faithful to the comics with Crystal and Black Bolt and everybody. Just good stuff. Good stuff. So if, if you know what's coming, you know what's coming. Because uh, we're starting out at Fantastic Four issue number 44. And so these these are the Inhumans coming up through these next couple issues here. Uh, 45 there. And this is this is old school Stan Lee Jack Kirby Gold. Uh, I don't even bust these out anymore because I just mostly read uh, reprints. Except I loan somebody my reprint. Uh, but this is the you know the first appearance of Karnak, Crystal, and Black Bolt right here in this one. Uh, Medusa was the first one to come on the scene. She was a member of the Frightful Four, and it it, re it gets revealed later that Medusa isn't like you know, a normal villain. She's there's, there's something more going on there because she's an inhuman. <sighs> Look at this black bolt, glorious black bolt with a big crease down the cover. Jay Lee and humans, Joel. Yes. The Jay Lee and humans was a fantastic run. What was it, about 12 issues? God, so good. Jay Lee is just fantastic. Now Jay Lee did an amazing Namor. Jay Lee's Namor is like tops for me. doesn't get any better than that. Uh, and I love Jay Lee so much. I went and, uh, oh God, there was one he did, was it for, uh, image hell shock, hell shock, I think was the name of the comic book. And I, it was one of those that, you know, it was like wet works from Will's Portatio, uh, where you got, you know, the first issue to great fanfare. And then the next couple issues were delayed months and months because like these cats had so much on their plate and trying to get everything done and, you know, being super perfectionist about their own work was the thing. Uh, and issue 47 here, you know, the Fantastic Four in Adelan. Uh, it's the first of Maximus the Mad, who is like uh, it's Black Bolt's brother, if y'all don't know. And dude's crazy. Dude's crazy. But yes, Medusa is awesome. So what I have here, it's got me so excited I'm shaking the camera. What I have here is my holy grail in the comic book. Uh, I, there was a comic book shop in East Lansing that I got this at, uh, campus comics doesn't exist there any longer. Uh, I had a pretty good relationship with, and I mentioned them earlier that a place I ended up getting the 10 cent, uh, comics from, uh, had a pretty good relationship with the owner of the spot and he ended up cutting me a deal on this, um, which I actually made the deal better for him in the end. Cause I was like, yeah, we could do that. Or you could just throw in this issue as well. So what is this, right? This is Fantastic Four number 48, and it's in dang fine condition. Um, there's a little bit of action here at the corners. One or two little bits, eh, three or four little bits along the spine, but generally that, that cover is really nice looking. And yes, this is the first appearance of the Fantastic Four, or uh, Fantastic Four, not. First appearance of the Silver Surfer. Uh, it's also the first appearance of Galactus in Cameo. Now, see, they'll they'll see that say that you'll see that when you see somebody's first appearance, and then you see cameo. And that what that means is generally that they show up in the very last panel. 
uh, of a comic book to kind of give you a teaser for the next one. Okay. So at the end of this, you know, Silver Surfer's there. Johnny Storm's trying to suss, suss things out with them and like, hey, man, don't be flying around here doing kind of the crazy stuff. Why are you responsible for all this? And, and then, you know, they tussle a little bit and then you find out at the end Galactus is coming, right? And so what you have here on the, yes, it is an extra thick mylar. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Yeah, it is. Because um, this, this is my baby. I had it framed for a while. Of course, this, is, this thing doesn't see sunlight, of course. Um, because the colors on this color cover are fantastic. Um, but yeah, I see the watcher there. Um, finally got on with a watcher look today, did a little fresh cut, catch up on everything. Uh, also silver surfers from Zinla and Zinlavians by and large, the males are bald. So I think of myself as a Zinla. And here's 4849. It's actually... The edges out here are in better condition than the 48, but there's a little bit more wear on the spine here. Uh, and as you can see, there's a little tick there at the top. But yeah, just look at that Jack Kirby artwork, right? Like that is just so keen, so keen. And you get in there and you see uh, the illustrations that Kirby did for uh, Galactus's equipment that he brought to Earth. And like he did drawings of fans attached to... Um, hair dryers and all kinds of different like real world objects that he turned into all this like cosmic junk that Galactus was using to, to consume planets. Cause he had to essentially break down the planet into its core elements and then consume those through some kind of uh, osmosis or absorption or he'd store it on a ship and then use the reserves over time. And then of course, fantastic 450 ends up finishing that whole storyline and you see there the fantastic Kirby Surfer, just glorious, glorious. So yeah, and then, so the Fantastic Four are just a fun bunch of just superheroes. Uh, Johnny Storm and Thing kind of have their own relationship. And then Johnny and Sue, because they're brother and sister, had that whole sibling thing going, which if you have a sibling, you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, here's, here's one for you. Uh, first appearance of Claw, you might remember him as uh, the villain from Black Panther. Got uh, this one here. Dr. Doom's trying to steal the, fan, or, uh, the Silver Surfer's powers, which she does kind of for a hot second. And cast them out. Some more there. Let's see what other... Oh. Okay, uh... So I, I did misspeak a little bit earlier, and I said that uh, the X-Men was at 53 was the first appearance of Blastar. It did have Blastar, but it wasn't the first appearance of Blastar. This is the first appearance of Blastar, but not drawn by Barry Windsor Smith. So Fantastic Four 62. And if you know who Blastar is, then good for you, because like a lot of folks don't. Uh, this one is, is pretty awesome. Um, this is the first appearance of Ronan the Accuser. And uh, Decree Supreme Intelligence, which you may or may not know that I did a build on that. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to pull that in because I, I promised Aqua Mike we'd take a look at it. Uh, this is the first appearance of him, a.k.a. Adam Warlock. Uh, he is in the cocoon, so his super cocoon baby. And here is a follow-up issue on that. And you see the cocoon there. Yeah, bigger than life. So, yeah, these, these are the things that, you know, sustain my uh, college years, really. Uh, I got in Silver Surfer as a teen, and by the time I got to college and was making my own money, this is where it was going. It was going to comic books. And this is uh, the issue that I got in a deal with the Fantastic 48. I was like, yeah, you can give me that discount, but if you just throw in that Fantastic 477, we can call it good. So the dude did, and this thing, like that cover, is the most pristine of any of the Fantastic Four ones I went through so far uh easily very fine uh grading wise no foxing no uh no sp no spine wear uh the cover is lined up very nicely the colors are bright and fresh i mean this this thing is just aces all the way so yeah i mean a lot of the other stuff i got in here is fantastic for uh silver surfer appearances other cosmic people appearances Galactus, strange Doctor Doom stuff. 
later Fantastic Four. Now, here's a, here's a Fantastic Four storyline that I think a lot of folks like. Um, Art Adams was a illustrator for Marvel back in the day and did some really great work on this bit here. So I think it was three or wow, they really did. So this this issue gone all the way up to third printing. Okay, and the reason why, uh, and every once in a while you see a first and second printing. Uh, from what I understand, the Fantastic Four is coming to the MCU. Uh, I saw somebody had a like a timetable of like all the Marvel releases coming up in the foreseeable future, and Fantastic Four was under a TBD, so to be determined. Um, but hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, so yeah, what's going on in this uh, great run here um, is the new Fantastic Four. Is you know the the main folks get apprehended, sidelined, whatever. So they have to bring in a new Fantastic Four, right? This is your new Fantastic Four. Uh, so it's Wolverine, the Hulk, Grey Hulk, okay? Uh, Spidey and Ghost Rider are the new Fantastic Four. I mean, it was a good story. People jumped on it. Uh, like I say, that, that, that first issue of it had three printings. And I think the, the subsequent issues also had multiple printings on it, too. But, yeah, what a great story. And, I mean, it's it's good stuff. Mole Man is, of course, involved. Mole Man was the uh, Fantastic Four's first villain that they encountered in Fantastic Four number one. Because um, he's he's a Mole Man. He doesn't 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 concern himself with the uh, with the doings of the surface dwellers. He lives underground with his mole people and does mole things. So everything else back in here is just more Fantastic Four random appearances and stuff. So you get to this event, okay? And this is like the last thing I I did before I started not reading comic books on the weekly, daily, monthly basis. After this, I switched over to more getting things in the trade paperback or graphic novel form. And then after that, just eventually just reading them online somewhere or checking them out from the library, which um, Michigan State has a special collection section, okay? Um, which is approximately 4 million plus volumes stored in like a very large basement that spans over two library wings. Um, and they have the world's largest comic book collection now. They have Detective Comics twenty seven. I've and you you have to you have to go through all this stuff and you don't have to necessarily put on gloves, but you can't have any ink around you or anything when you go down to special collections. You can check these out. You can read them out, but you have to read them out in the reading room, at which you are under supervision like constantly, and you can read any comic book ever, pretty much, and multiple ver language versions of some of them. Disappointed by all three Fantastic Four movies? No, no. The first two were fantastic, of course. That like they were great. Like the characters, the casting was spot on. Um, Chris Evans is Johnny Storm. You can't get any better than that, really. Chickless is uh, the thing. That that was maybe maybe where I was a little bit lighter on, you know, because I mean I, I dig Michael Chickless, fellow ball guy. Yeah, whatever. Um, but Ian Grufford as uh, Mister Fantastic and Alba as uh, the Invisible Woman. Uh, I mean, the casting in that was inspired. Uh, the the entire thing was just great. Fantastic Four one and the um, Rise of the Silver Surfer. Love those movies. Like just they they jazz me so much. Now the third movie, the third movie I got some serious hangups with. Where do we start? Okay, let's let's start at where the movie starts. Okay, you have a young Reed Richards and Ben Grimm, uh, the thing, who, uh, I mean, Ben. Uh, they befriend each other when they're, you know, kids in like sixth, fifth or sixth grade. And like, I, I guess Ben lives in a junkyard and Reed needs a piece to work on this thing he's doing. And then they, they, they take, you know, the, the thing he's after and they go and work on the thing. And he's trying to, you know, install it in this big apparatus that apparently he's worked on for months, if not years. 
you know, in his basement. And the kid doesn't have the sense, like he's using like a butter knife or something to, to screw in a Phillips head screw. And so Ben Grimm's like, here, here's a Phillips head screwdriver. It's the one that works for that or something like that. That's that, that immediately took me out of the film. Um, how are you going to be like Reed Richards? Isn't one of the people who is like brilliant slash stupid. Okay. He's one of the people who are brilliant slash maybe I don't read other people that well kind of thing. Right. So the fact that he wouldn't know to use a Phillips head screwdriver is just insanely foolish. Um, not to mention the fact that, I mean, it's just the, the whole dynamic between the team. Uh, it just, just was off. Uh, my favorite thing about the entire movie, of course, was Johnny Storm. Uh, I don't know why Johnny Storm was trying to race an MR2. That's so not the car that I seen him driving. But, I mean, Michael B. Jordan was fantastic. He was great. He, he was perfectly cast for that role. Everybody else, I mean, I, I expected more from Miles Teller. I really did. But the performances weren't, weren't what, what hurt it. The, what, what hurt it was the writing. Uh, Reg Caffey as um, Doctor Storm uh, wa was just inspired. He was good, but the but the writing was horrible. The dialogue was bad. The premises for everything was just just off all the way. Kate Mara was okay as Susan Storm, but she wasn't Susan Storm. You know, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking about that right there. I'm just just gonna wrap that up in it. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at something called Heroes Reborn, which is this. Okay, is a um, Marvel Universe ended up getting pretty much destroyed by oh, what was that cat's name? Um, it's like Franklin Richards. Something begins with an O. I can't even think of it. I'm I'm blanking because like big purple and pink guy. I can't remember it. Anyway, he. Uh, yeah, they did get pro actors for the movie. They, the actors, they pulled out all the stops for it. The writing department is where they really needed to do the work. Um, and it wasn't a matter of a director's cut or anything like that, like the guy tried to claim it when it first got put out there. It was writing, writing all the way. Writing is what tanked that movie. Um, so, yeah, you got your Fantastic Four. Um, they also uh, restarted... Uh, Iron Man and Thor and the Avengers. Um, and I think there might have been one or two more. Uh, but it was pretty much the image guys coming back to Marvel and relaunching their popular titles, right? Because, you know, things kind of hit the slump. Uh, Fantastic Four got up above issue 400 and kind of slowed down a little bit. Uh, and same for all these other, other ones. But what really drives the comic book industry is the first issue, you know, issue number one of a lot of things, because people will go out there and buy issue number one of something just because it's issue number one. And they think, you know, maybe there's a chance in the future that it's going to hold some value. Well, they relaunched their entire, you know, big hitter line with issue number ones across the board. So it, it kind of reset the issue count. Okay. So it, that's a way it made it more appealing to, to new fans, just jumping in there, getting, getting in a, on it late. So uh, they, they retold a lot of the, you know, original old school stories from the Marvel comics. So uh, you got Namor versus the Fantastic Four coming up again. You've got the Namor Sue Storm love interest thing kind of kind of cranking in there. Um, Black Panther showing up there too. Everybody in space doing the thing, getting a little bit cosmic with it. You know, you had extra covers by other image artists. So Will Spartacio doing this uh, Christmas issue for or Christmas cover for the Fantastic Four. Um, Doctor Doom, of course, coming in. And these were drawn by Jim Lee. So, you know, it's, it's top notch what, stuff. All right, Aqua Mike. Um, actually, before you go real quick, I'm going to grab uh, Supreme Intelligence so you can see. Okay. So, <laughs> and we've just seen the uh, first appearance of this guy not too long ago. But this this is a little bit uh, slammed together of a construction, okay? Because a lot of the small circular bits are small circular bits. They're two by two plates, the way this guy's put together. And he's blobby, multi-brain kind of thing here. So the bottom isn't pretty, but it's two of those uh, 
I think it's 12 by 12 Technic brick things. It's just a large platform essentially, but they're inverted here. Uh, and I don't really know why I inverted it. I really just guess I didn't need to. But I used uh, I used the studs up um, or the studs down in the front on the mouth, and it kind of worked for what I needed there. But yeah, so that is put together like that. And because you know you have anti stud to anti stud, the way this is connected really is on the sides here uh, with an axle going through the uh, two by two tiles or two by two plates. So. That's how I really put this one together. And of course, this was me saving uh, dark turquoise for a long time. And then they came out with these uh, these little macaroni brick bits for, uh, these came with the Vibe City concert for the trolls. And so I ended up getting that and putting that on there. <laughs> it needs a play function, yeah. Um, hopefully I, someday I, I intend to encase this kind of in a monitor because I mean, that's, Supreme Intelligence was inside a computer, pretty much. But this is how he presented himself to everybody. Um, but yeah, it kind of does need a play function. Uh, it, it, like it, it's huge and menacing. It has a big mouth, but it doesn't eat people. Uh, it just talks a lot of smack, really. And really has a hate on for the uh, scrolls. So that's 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 the Supreme Intelligence there. And, you know, it's Supreme Intelligence lays down the directives for the Kree Empire, which means he's running the show for Ronan the Accuser and everybody. Uh, so yeah, this 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 was a pretty pretty all right build. Um, the tough thing for me was was getting those eyes just right, where it had that sunken look, but it also had that yellow glow. So that's that's just a voodoo ball stuck on a uh, plate there, and then around here I did a lot of shaping with uh, wedges and curves, and uh, even got bionicle feet there to kind of get the cheekbones a little bit, just to just kind of get that shape and that definition. Um, over time, I, I do want to rework this bottom lip and give it kind of a, you know, more of a, so eventually that's, that's what I'm going to be working on. on that. But yeah, I just, hopefully Marco Mike, you got to see this real quick before you left. Because the Supreme Intelligence was it's just a crazy, wild, out there, huge, ugly looking character. Uh, thanks, Joel. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it was one of my favorites from Stor Silver Surfer stories from back in the day, because Lo and behold, there was another Kree Skrull War. I mean, they, they say it was like the second Kree Skrull War, but really, I don't think the thing ever stopped. You know, I mean, they may have come to a truce, but there's there's so much bad blood between the two that, you know, they're, they're never going to see eye to eye on it. Um, but yeah, so there was that. And I'm going to start putting these back here. But yeah, so even, even in this, where, which issue was it? Because, of course, they didn't wait till issue 48. Um, but, you know, Galaxus shows up in there, too. So, so yeah, this this was uh, this was a nice march down memory lane here. Uh, not too bad for April. And the other box I have over here that I haven't tapped into is pretty much all Silver Surfer Volume 3 and annuals and things like that and there's one issue i do want to show you there because it's where this little design came from for thanos in this air chariot Let's see if i can get that real quick well maybe not real quick but pretty quick all right yeah All right, so we got Surfer, Surfer, and Hooded One was talking earlier about the Mobius, uh, Mobius Silver Surfer issues, and these are those here. But you can see his treatment of the Surfer, especially with skull shape and, and the details and the cross hatching that he did around Galactus, just super stellar, amazing stuff. Uh, made me think of the Surfer in a completely different light. So that's Silver Surfer Volume Two, or I mean. That's 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 a miniseries. This is Silver Surfer Volume Two. Silver Surfer Volume Two is a single issue. Yeah, yeah, real art for real. Um, that guy was just leaps and bounds above everybody else. Okay. So when Thanos came back, Thanos came back essentially from. The uh, Thanos Quest stuff right into Silver Surfer because Jim Starlin had taken over the uh, 
the run of Silver Surfer at that point. And so it, the whole Infinity Gauntlet thing was kicking off in Silver Surfer. And this chariot right here is from issue 36. Thirty-five issue thirty-five, and in, in inside it, it's it's got a little bit more detail to it. it. It's presented as gray in some some times, and this like a shiny gold thing. But it's essentially Thanos talking to Silver Surfer and showing him stuff and getting him uh, getting a little bit more familiar with him. Because at this point, Silver Surfer doesn't really know who Thanos is, um, but by the end of this issue, he knows who Thanos is. So this is Thanos' little uh, thing to write around in for that. And I mean, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite things ever. Large Mobius collection, yeah. Um, I was talking earlier about uh, going to the MSU special collections and reading different things. And I ended up reading a lot of Mobius' stuff because a lot of his stuff is published because he's not American. Um, it was published in foreign language comics. So uh, stuff that I couldn't really read too well, but and stuff that wasn't available to me. So, I mean, I got a little bit of Spanish under my belt. I can make heads and tails of Italian and uh, French and small bits and maybe a little bit of Latin, just a little, little bit. Um, but I'm not, <laughs> English is really the only language I'm a master of. Um, and so I would go down there uh, when I had spare time because I was an art student at MSU. And I also worked in, uh, I worked in the library um, making different boxes and things for special collections. So, Oh, the Jim Star Starling cameo in, in, in game. Yeah, in, in game was filled with a lot of nice little Easter eggs like that. Uh, a lot of it is translated into English now. Um, but back in the day, we were talking probably 97, 98, 99, somewhere in there. Because uh, like I say, I was, I was aware of special collections because I was making um, boxes for them for, for old volumes that you know really couldn't stand up to a lot of handling and shelving and unshelving things like that so like protective stuff for them uh, i also went through and uh, one of the things i did was i evaluated books that would be sent from special collections or from the regular collection at msu uh to get an acid treatment for the pages to to see if they were it was something viable enough for us to send off and uh have that process done to them so i worked in book repair uh, that was that was my thing, and I I got to go into the back stacks in uh, special collections a couple times and deliver things. And I I tell you what, when you when you go in there, it's like it's it's like in Indiana Jones where they're putting the uh, Ark of the Covenant back, and you know this is just endless endless stacks and rows and just just massive infinite warehouse. So that that's what special collections is kind of like. And then after that, I was like, all right, I'm going to start reading things and because I was aware of the Mobius uh, miniseries there, I had that Mobius miniseries, I ended up trying to at least look at the artwork for everything that I could find that the guy had done. And just fantastic, fantastic. Certainly has his own signature style. And I might have to go back and check up on some of that stuff because it is translated now. But yeah, this this was my first real big introduction to Thanos and who Thanos was. And I was hooked. Excuse me, I was hooked ever since. Um, and Thanos and the Surfer buck down, and they 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 throw down epically. And of course, Thanos has got power projection power. So, like, it was never a throwing like knives or you know spinning blades or wh whatever your your thing might be on that. That that was never Thanos' deal. Thanos' deal was always to do some nasty stuff like he he'd have a lot of minions working for him um but that was just because they knew how powerful he was and like they didn't want to get on his bad side kind of a deal um but to kind of wrap up the whole comic book talk from today um when i started getting out of marvel and dc and things like that and i, I was fortunate enough to stay in on the comic book thing and read the J jla run from grant morrison um up to like issue 25. And that's kind of where I started getting out of comics. Um, but Dark Horse, like I said earlier, uh, brought a lot of manga over, you know, stateside. Uh, so Akira, uh, Blackjack, Astro Boy, uh, things like that I got into back in the day, uh, Ghost in the Shell, Masamune Shiro stuff. Uh, so 
that's where I started gra gravitating, you know, because it was a little bit cheaper. Uh, it was easier to find these issues and stuff online. Uh, so I got huge in the manga and anime and stuff like that. So I uh, eventually got into Suzuka, Sama Suzuka, the Astro Boy, uh, Blackjack, Phoenix, done things like that. Just pretty much the god, the godfather of of, of comics in Japan. Um, definitely get get down with it if you can. Yeah, Akira, Akira. I got volume one through six sitting right up there. Yeah, it's it, it's great, and the story goes so much further than the book does. Like the book takes you pretty much to the end of like the first big chapter of Akira, and then after that, the story goes on because the way the movie presents it and the way it is at the beginning, um, Kaneda and Joker, the clown, the leader of the clown gang, are adversarial. But over time, because you know Akira is here and you know messing up all kinds of stuff, they have to you know they they kind of come to an understanding and there's a kinship a team. Teamwork, if you will, they they're they're on the same side. So yeah, definitely definitely a great read. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, Katsushiro Oto Otomo is amazing. Um, but yeah, Akira, I saw that when I was young, and like instantly my mind got captured by it. And it was that motorcycle. It was Kaneda's bike, right? Um, and you know, it it wasn't so much the bike itself because the design is fantastic on it. But what really got me when I saw the cartoon uh was the taillights like he'd you know come to a screeching halt and you know spin the back of the bike and you'd see the streaks from the taillights and for some reason that's what captured my mind that's what captured my imagination that's what got me into it and so then yeah i just kind of went down that rabbit hole um good times though good times but yeah so i i i do read a lot of manga um i read yeah there are a couple um couple versions of Kaneda's bike in Lego that are, that are pretty good. Um, I, back in the day, I had the intention of, uh, you remember X pods? Um, they, they had like red coverings for the X pods. It was, you know, kind of a like clear translucent body of a thing and it had a cap and another one on the top. And so, it, you know, it just looked like a little pod. It was like sandwiched between two big discs. And I had gotten the, the red discs um, to build for the back tire, uh, but I never actually built it. So I haven't actually built Kaneda's bike. I have the McFarlane Toys version of the Kaneda's bike. And so if I still have an existing toy for a franchise, that's not always something I'll seek out to build. And there are a lot of people out there who've done stellar builds for Kaneda's bike. And so if somebody's already trod that territory and it's, it's enough for me to kind of step back and say, whoa, sometimes it just won't touch it. But I do love Kaneda's bike. I'd need a Kaneda to, to ride Kaneda's bike or Tetsuo. And I don't think I'm going to make a Lego Tetsuo very soon. Um, but I don't know. That's something in the future that I might do. Uh, my next project, comic book wise, big figure wise, I'm going to make Ego. I'm going to make the living planet. It's going to be <laughs> 16 by 16 plates uh, in a cube. And then, of course, um, make it spherical but i i still i'm on the fence whether i want to go guardians of the galaxy 2 version colors which is pretty much blue and like a dark red for the character or if i want to go classic where it's like purple and all these other different colors kind of mixed together and he's got like a beard showing through and craggly and stuff uh so so i'm still trying to figure out where i'm going on that and i i do have babu frick yet to build so once i get this building out of the way this this building is like the next step in my order of operations that needs to get taken care of before I can really start doing anything else in this room. Uh, it's taking up a lot of space. It's taking up a lot of bricks. Um, I have a whole lot of stuff reserved to throw out this building should it need it. So hopefully by next week, I'll have something to show you. Ideas globe for the base. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the ideas globe. I don't know if I want to go because that's that's more of a uh, Lowell Sphere type looking thing, I think. And I don't know if I want to go bumpity bumpity or smoothly boodily around around the edges because I'm thinking like curved slopes for a lot of it and stuff. I, but I mean, we'll we'll see, we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. And I've I've learned that trying to wait for ideas to put their products out, even though you know what's coming, um, that could be a daunting thing. Uh, most notably with me, it was this. This little number right here. 
Okay. And this was just a gift we purchased. They had to translate from the original design into the actual Lego bricks and then, you know, produce it. And it took longer than I had thought it would take to do that. So I'm not going to be waiting for the globe. Um, I'm, I am going to be waiting for the Seinfeld set. Seinfeld set is like tops on my list right now of things in the pipeline from Lego coming at, at you soon. So whenever, whenever Sam Johnson and his team get that all set and ready to go, I will be the happiest little fanboy in the world. I'm going to get it, of course, at midnight, and I will be – that's going to be a place that I will be playing the hell out of with. I mean, these pretzels are making me thirsty. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, making Carl Feynman furniture for Kramer's place. I'm going to put a spa, uh, sauna over there. Uh, a Kenny Rogers roaster sign coming in this window. Kramer's going to have his own apartment, of course. And there's going to be a hallway and, you know, maybe, maybe Newman's apartment. You know, there is just, we're going to have to see. But yes, I'm very excited for the Seinfeld set. I've watched Seinfeld all the way through. Uh, initially, I watched it when it aired as much as I could. And then the DVDs came out, binged the whole thing. A couple of years later, binged it all again. Um, and I'm probably looking to do another binge very soon here. And of course, you know, it's very syndicated show. So Seinfeld's out there and it's successful. It's awesome. And it's a little bit timeless. Most of it is a little bit timeless, which, which is really great. And these characters just don't really care. They, <laughs> they're not good people, you know, they're not, you know, out there doing things for the community. They're very selfish individuals, which I don't know why it appeals to me so much, but I love it. I absolutely love it. Yes, yes. Um, Wayne Knight did show up as uh, uh, he was in the uh, uh, Jurassic Park set. Oh, God, what was his name in that? Oh, I can't think of it right now. If Tiffany were here, she'd kick me because, like, I should know this. Um, but, yeah, he's he was in that. So I was very, very much thinking about picking up the Jurassic Park set <laughs> because of that. Uh, and, you know, Sam Jackson's in there, too. So, yeah, you got to love that. Sam Neill, maybe not so much. I, I do have Sam Neill and Laura Dern over here from another uh, Lego Jurassic set. But, yeah, yeah, when uh, when that one came out, A, I was, you know, Florin. Florin? That's a word. I was just making it up. Floored. I was floored by, you know, the immense size of the T-Rex in that set and the size of the gate. But I was also absolutely taken with the figures. And I do need an Ian Malcolm. I need a Jeff Goldblum. Um, I never did get the Fly collectible minifigure, which is a big regret for me. Because those ones, the, like the Halloween costume sets, seem to fly off the shelf faster than most of the other uh, collectible minifigures in the area around here. So I do want to go back through and try and find that one. I've seen it like for like four bucks places. I've seen it for eight or more in other Brickling stores. So we're, we're going to see how that goes. But yeah, so thanks everybody for stopping by. Um, Marvel versus DC. Of course, I, I skew more Marvel, but I do love DC characters. And I there are some Marvel titles and characters that I absolutely hate. Um, same for DC. So, I mean, it's, it's more of who's doing what title at what time, what characters are involved, you know, th that kind of thing for me. Um, I, I love Valiant, but not all of Valiant. There, there are some titles I like. There's some titles I absolutely hate. Samer Image, Wildstorm, Top Cow, uh, any of the other ones out there you want to um, mention that came through. Uh, Dark Horse. Dark Horse had, had some stellar titles. Dark Horse had, also had some big tankers. Um, you may or may not remember Barbed Wire and Ghost and that whole harbor thing that went down. Um, although Barbed Wire be, became a thing and became a movie, so you know that's there. Uh, but manga is very close to my heart. Uh, I do read uh, a lot of One Piece. One Piece is the greatest. In my, in my opinion, everything else aside, comics, you know, that we've talked about today, Silver Surfer and everything, and Sandman, Sandman, yes. And Sandman is great because it's Neil Gaiman for the entire run. Uh, one through 75, that, that entire bit. And then, of course, you know, little later ones. And I do have them all collected over here on my shelf, which you can kind of see peeking over behind this box here. This is where I keep my graphic novels, trade paperbacks, things like that. So my Matt Wagner stuff there. I got Unity, which is a Valiant, uh, Valiant crossover series, which is fantastic. Um, the bootleg One Piece. I've seen bootleg One Piece stuff out there. I've seen people do uh, idea submissions for One Piece, which are fantastic. Um, but I don't, for me, for me personally, Ichiro Oda doesn't translate well into bricks. 
um, unless you're probably doing big built figures. But I mean, you go from somebody like Luffy, who is pretty much very, very skinny to, to people like Blackbeard or Magellan or just like these huge, beefy, bigger than life characters uh, or, or Frankie or somebody like that, who is, you know, starts off as kind of a human cyborg. And then he just like amps himself way the hell up, you know, becomes like General Frankie. And all that. Um, the absolute editions. Yeah. The, the only actual uh, I've, I've read as many as I could up to about a year ago. I was I was all caught up with one piece. Um, I fell behind on the episodes because I got to somewhere around 780 something episodes watched and then Hulu stopped carrying it. So I'm going to have to go to Funimation or someplace and get on with that and then catch up. Cause that's a lot. I have a lot of episodes to catch up for on one piece um, and also for the comics. But once I feel comfortable going to the library again, my local library Keeps all the collected uh, tank bonds, the the numbered issues of One Piece there, uh, and it's up to date. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have some serious catching up. Um, but yeah, the only storyline I really have here uh, on hand because I the only one I really want to read over and over and over and over again is the Impel Down uh, storyline, which I mean, like Luffy goes and breaks into the biggest, most secure prison to rescue his brother. And he teams up with people he's already defeated going down to the very bottom of Impel Down, which is like a sub, a sub, uh, subterranean, uh, under it's, under, under uh, it's a prison under the ocean is what it is essentially. And so he's got to get all the way down to the bottom level to get ACE. Um, but once he gets down there, his brother has already been taken to be executed at the Marine base. Um, and so while he's down there, he's like freeing people left and right and, um yeah so i anyway yeah if you haven't read one piece if you haven't gotten into one piece please go ahead and get into one piece you can start from the beginning you can start from anywhere really um the earlier stuff of course the 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 drawing and the storyline has it has a way to go uh character development as well but it, i mean if you stick with it and these these read quick if you stick with it and get through it by the time you are you've got nami on the scene and usopp and uh, Zoro, things things really start to uh, get the ball rolling, and then like these Nakama just come together and, and form a great group. So definitely, it, it is a jumping or er, jumping in there is a daunting prospect for sure, um, and definitely easier to read than it is to watch because the episodes are like five minutes of opening theme and backstory. Then you have maybe 10 minutes or 12 minutes of actual story that they do. And then you've got the in, another two minutes of in credits and what's coming up in the next episode. So, I mean, you can fast forward through that stuff and get through there a little bit faster, but um, you, it doesn't have the same flow. It doesn't have the same uh, push of a story arc as reading the books actually does. Plus they, they, they throw in a couple things in there too. But yeah, one piece, if you can get down with it, get down with it. Um, if you have a library that has them on hand, do read them. It's you, you won't regret it. It's the greatest comic book ever. Um, why? Because it's gone on for so long. It's the same guy, uh, writing and drawing. I mean, manga artists do have, uh, assistants helping them out doing like backgrounds and different details and other things. But like those cats are workhorses every week. They're turning out new stuff. So that's why I respect Japanese comics more than American comics because uh, the rate that they got to come out, like not monthly, it's weekly. And they have editors who are seriously hawking over their stuff. Um, and if something's not great, you got to start over again and you got to get like the same amount of work done as an American co uh, comic artist would in, in a month. Um, and thankfully most of it's in black and white. So uh, the uh, it, it is cheaper and it, uh, it's a little bit more stylized, so definitely get get down with it. Yeah, M mangaka are just the awesomest. Um, there is a really great uh, story by the guys who did Death Note, um, which if you haven't read Death Note, something else to read, something else to watch. Um, and it's Bakuman, and it is about these teens who want to be mangaka. So they start in you know like middle school, high school, and they're writing and drawing their own stuff and they're you know a team of writer and artist which 
you know, the the actual people who make the comic are kind of that as, as well. So it's, it's a little bit of them thrown into it, but it shows the whole process of, of coming up in the game, uh, getting your stuff published, getting in a book, and then making a story and keeping it you know, consistent through, you know, because because the, the idea over there is not to, you know, start a storyline and then finish a storyline. The idea is start a storyline and make it go as long as people can read it. And then to keep bringing people in with different, uh, you know, switching it up when when things are dropping down a little bit, you know, they're, they're taking surveys over there. The readers are taking surveys, you know, which which did they prefer most out of this issue? Because when you buy comic books over there, the weekly stuff, you're buying an, uh, an issue that's probably like yay thick and it's got 20 or so stories in it from different different artists, different stuff. And so it's kind of a collection. And so you buy it every week and you get your, like your weekly dose. And then once so many of those chapters have come out, maybe 20 or so, they put them in a tank bond and uh, you can buy them just like your regular over-the-counter manga you find stateside. Uh, so yes, absolutely get down with that stuff if you can. That's that. I mean, I, I, I was hoping to get to that earlier uh, rather than this this far late in the thing. But once I once I start going through these comics, man, I mean, you just don't know what I'm going to find in there. I know what I'm going to find in there, but I'm constantly surprised by, by what I find in there. So yeah, I've I've kind of dialed back on the purchasing and reading of comic books, especially stateside stuff. Um, but my love for it uh, is ingrained from childhood. It runs very deep, and that's why I made Galactus and and made the supreme intelligence and the other characters and and went so far with this because like this captured my imagination this this was this was my touchstone uh as as a teen you know this 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 is what kept me grounded even though it's pretty fantastical stuff so yeah um absolutely yeah grindle figures yeah i have uh i have one downstairs uh what i think it was a dynamic forces figure and or something, but they also did like a Jay and Silent Bob uh, two pack of figures where uh, they had uh, voice act voice buttons, right? So you press the back of Jay and he says, you know, all kinds of Jay stuff like Snoogans and I'm a clam digger man. I'm all about the brown. Or and then you know Silent Bob's got a button on there too, but you press the button, of course, nothing happens, which is like freaking brilliant. So um, they made the Grindle figure as well, and they also made a Matt Wagner uh, Mage figure. Uh, which which I had for the longest time and which I think I ended up selling, which I regret a little bit, just a little bit, because that, that character was phenomenal. <laughs> next week, Independence. Yeah, um, next week, uh, actually, I don't even know where I'm, where I'm going with next week. Um, next week, I hope to review the buildings that I'm working on and that I've just finished up, because I'd like to take this down and take a look inside there. Because there's a lot going on in that garage, and there's a lot going on in the museum uh, in a very tight, compact space. Uh, so I want to kind of take a look at that. And also very soon I'm going to be lighting the upper part and that's going to give light to gas down into the bottom parts too. Uh, but once I get this thing over here finished, the, the, the giant Lego store slash city services building, which is just kind of a generic title for it right now. I do want to take a look at that and show it off because what I want to do is I want to make it to where it's not going to be your typical modular where, you know, bits stack on top of each other. It's going to be one where the front will open up. Line kind of like a cabinet to where you can access everything in there. And I'm hoping that'll lend it uh, a little bit more accessibility when it comes to trying to do something like stop motion, which hopefully someday I'm going to, I'm going to get into it. Yeah. Hooded one wants me to talk about bone. Yeah. I, I, I ended up selling my Jeff Smith bone collection because I, I didn't have the individual issues. I had the collections. Uh, what was it, like one through eight or something like that for the original ones. And, um, <laughs> I ended up selling them because I think they ended up putting out a hardcover edition and I was going to use that money to, um, to get the hardcover editions, but I never ended up getting the hardcover editions. So I don't know what was going on upstairs. I mean, I, there, Barry Windsor Smith, they also had collections of some of his stuff too. There's Barry Windsor Smith, Opus number one and Opus volume two, which is some of his, his, his side stuff. Um, but I think I, 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 sold something somewhere in some time and never actually got the thing I was supposed to get. So yeah. Yeah. The individual issues. I, I, I came to bone a little bit late, honestly, I, I came to bone um, after they were already putting out the uh, trade paperbacks for him. So, uh, but I, I just love Jeff Smith's style. Like it's so, it's very Disney, but 
it's like the weight of his lines are just insane, you know? Uh, and, it, and it's, you know, black and white. So it's so good. So good. But yeah, I got to, uh, I got to get back into that. Yeah. Stop motion is, is like an end goal. It, it's always kind of been a thing in the back of my head for, for where I want to go with this, but like, I've never quite gotten the city to a point where I'm like satisfied with it. Or, now that I got these tables in a stable, um, I can set up a camera and not worry about it jostling too much between shots, which was a very big concern for me. Oh, the, um, the X-Men storm stories. I have those. I have those in the, uh, <laughs> in the, in the comic book, uh, sanctum over here. Uh, just, just glance at them. Oh, and one more thing while we're on that, while we're on Barry Windsor Smith storm stories, actually, I've got a little, uh, little extra something over here. So, so many folks may not know, um, there was a little pocket story in the Uncanny X-Men uh, drawn, it was called Life Death, uh, drawn by Barry Windsor Smith and written by him too, I think. Or was that, no, no, it was Claremont. Claremont wrote him. Um, but it was like, I'm pretty sure, it was, it was a little side thing where Forge and Storm were isolated somehow through, uh, from 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 the rest of the gang, like they were in a different world and they were trapped there for a year or so, and so of course they developed a relationship and things and um and there was a love and once they got out of that, like it kept getting referenced a little bit here and there, but nothing really played into it too much until Will's Portatio took over the Uncanny X Men and you know, somewhere around issue two, somewhere in the two eighties, two seventies, very close to three hundred, uh, that that entire thing got revisited again, like that, that past love between Storm and Forge and where they are now with it. But uh, Barry Windsor Smith did a follow-up story to that and it never got published by Marvel, uh, but he still maintained the, the rights to the work. So he republished it under his own, under the name Adastra for Aurora Monroe. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty much about her as essentially a storm goddess or a goddess of you know the weather and so it goes through and it, it just kind of rewrites writes things a little bit to make it so it can be you know published outside of marvel but yeah yeah that's 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 totally storm with the mohawk there you you can see it yeah yeah it's it's a good one to get a hold of joel um this was was it dark horse fantagraphic fantagraphic books so yeah, definitely got to get down with it because you know Barry Windsor Smith is freaking phenomenal. Okay, uh, this cost me fifteen dollars initially. I'm not sure how much it'd be today or if how easy it would be to find, but definitely great. It's got a uh, dust cover on it underneath that. I think it's just uh, uh, just a traditional book binding. Yeah, yeah. So. so yeah, definitely get down with that. Um, if you don't know who Barry Windsor Smith is, please go check out Barry Windsor Smith. Uh, I'm going to try and go through, and when I do a description for this video, try and cover all the bases that we did today, just so if people are searching for something, like they'll they'll end up here and like, who's at Astra? And then that, that'll do that. Um, but yeah, so thanks you everybody for showing up for this large rambling talk about comic books today. Uh, I, I only even scratched the surface, really, of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and like Hooded One brings up like the independent comic books, like it goes on forever. We could talk Ninja Turtles. Uh, we could talk. <laughs> we, 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 we could talk about Strangers, Strangers in Paradise. We could talk Love and Rockets. Um, just thinking of a couple things right off the top of my head. You know, uh, we could talk Black Hole. We could talk early Brian Michael Bendis stuff, you know, like Jinx and Torso, uh, things like that. Um, we could talk Daniel Close uh, because Daniel Close is awesome. You know, Ice Haven, uh, Ghost World, David Boring, things like that. Like there's there there are so uh, we could talk Boondocks. I mean, for crying out loud, we could talk Calvin and Hobbes. The the world of comics is vast and large, and it's not just Marvel and DC. And that was really the point I wanted to make today. Um, that the world's bigger than that. I mean, the comic world is bigger than that. Um, and it's out there and it's ready to be explored. So dive in if you can. Take take a chance if, if you get a chance. Uh, yeah, why the last man? Um, 
we could we could even talk about some really underground Marvel stuff like uh, Machine Man from back in the day. Another Barry Windsor Smith uh, reference there. Um, yeah, so so yeah, thank you everybody for showing up and checking things out, and the Crow for crying out loud, right? Um, James O'Barr's classic, The Crow, which I think it was Kitchen Sink Press that put that out. You know, and then you got the Mask from Dark Horse. You got Concrete. You got like the the list is endless. We could go on for hours and days. Sin City. Oh my God, yeah, Sin City, the great Frank Miller. I've got like the entire collected versions right up there on the shelf. Just good stuff that you could just keep going. Yeah, Sandman. Sandman's going to be a tough translation. Uh, not everything that Neil Gaiman does translates well to screen. Coraline. I was actually impressed they did okay. Richie Rich, yes, Richie Rich, and the um the gold key stuff. Uh, Archie, Archie comics. You know, it just, just there's so many comics going around. Before Frank Miller got crazy, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, I think Frank Miller was always kind of crazy, but like at one point, like crazy snaps, you know. And I think maybe maybe that happened a little bit with Jim Starlin too, because I mean now, um, back when he was making the uh, the cosmic stuff, like gods were, you know, the gods and things. There wasn't like a single, you know, guy. like everything. And, but but now it's like the one above all is I guess a thing and so you know but I mean it, it just it, back in the day of Spanish mind now it seems like they want to just kind of hone you in a little bit so we'll, we'll we'll see I mean people change over time writers change over time artists change over time Frank Miller changed over time not necessarily for the best yeah so good stuff to get into good stuff to get out there and read um. If you have the opportunity, if you have the chance, don't give up on print. Okay, it's it's a thing that's still out there. Don't don't confine yourself to movies and TV uh, for the for these comic book characters because that's just a very small aspect of them. Uh, go read something. But yeah, thank thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for checking in and checking things out. Like next week, I want to focus more on architecture and buildings and stuff like that because. You know, it's, it's a little bit more grounded than where we were today. Like today, we can go off on all kinds of tangents, and I, I kind of almost did. But uh, yeah, next week, we're going to be talking buildings. We're going to take a look at these. We're going to hopefully take a look at something like progress for the police station. But I just kind of wanted to take a break from building today um, and just 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 talk talk books, talk about books and comic books and nostalgia and bringing everything back up. Um, so yeah. Oh, thanks, Brinkin. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty sizable collection, and it's at least it's probably a quarter of the size of what it used to be. I had so many long boxes, but uh, yeah, thank you everybody for checking it out. Um, check out Brinkin's stream. Uh, she's on YouTube and Twitch uh, almost every day. So <laughs> check out her schedule. She's got it on there. She's got also a link tree uh, for her stuff too. So check it out um, on the 18th. Uh, April 18th, we're doing the Rebrick This, so go check that out too. Hashtag Rebrick This on Instagram is where we do the post. It's going to be Cyber Drone Set 31111. Right? Is that all the ones? I think it's all the ones. It's not the only one. There are many of them, but there are a lot of ones. I should do this more? Yeah, I, I, I see what, yeah, I, I should. I should, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, time is a thing. Um, it's getting nicer outside, so I'm going to be doing more outdoor activities and getting my yard in shape and things like that. Yeah. Um, and architecture is, uh, one of my great loves, uh, ever since I was a child, cause I, I grew up in Florida. I grew up in Lakeland, Florida. And in Lakeland, Florida, there is Florida Southern college. Florida Southern college is an entire campus designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And, you know, as a child growing up and being in the midst of that, it's just like, boom, like, you, you have to seek out more after that six times a week. <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I got that kind of energy to, to be able to keep that up. I mean, that's, that's more than I can really do. I mean, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's streaming every day except for Tuesday and Friday. So check her out, uh, YouTube and Twitch and, uh, check out tricky bricks. Uh, they just hit a hundred. Um, well, they hit a hundred episodes a little bit ago, but they hit, uh, the one year anniversary uh, was last Monday, 
the Monday before. But yeah, they've been around a while. Richard and Flynn from Lego Master Season One. Uh, we're we're members of Tricky Lugs, so we all hang out there. Uh, it's good times. They they stream Wednesday, Friday, and uh, Sunday now, so three times a week, and that's uh, that's at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, good stuff. Yeah, and twice on Sundays. Yeah, you're freaking easy. You're 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 on the airwaves. You you got it done. So nice, so nice. Um, yeah, I, I have a decent sized yard, but there's like no privacy here. So I don't have to worry about interacting with other folk. Um, so getting out and doing some yard work is going to be great because I'm not going to have Nora on my back all the time. Uh, Nora is right now sleeping down the hall, like five minutes before this whole thing started. She was up on my lap. She was all on me. She was all about this. But then she was like, you know what? Nah, I'm, I, I'm not going to go on stage today. So she, she's out. But yeah, so everybody, uh, take care, be safe. Uh, COVID cases are on the rise. Michigan is going through some kind of crazy thing right now. So, so be extra cautious, be extra vigilant. Don't let up on you know your safety measures until until you know we're we're a lot safer. So, so take care of yourself, folks. I love you so much. Thanks for checking it out. Uh, back again next week. Salutes. Peace, love, and hair grease, chicken grease, you know, however you can make it loose and funky, do it. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely a rambling today. today. So <laughs> thanks, everybody. Um, why is Michigan rising in COVID cases? Stupid people. I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. <laughs> See you guys. Bye.